and another Chromecast. Another week, another Chromecast. That's not true. We don't do it weekly. We lie to you. Nice. We... <laughs> um this Chromecast is going to be very interesting because we are going to dissect from documentary you know because you have to be critical with your own work so if Trump started because of this Trump documentary now is kind of the moment to reflect back a bit a bit and see what we agree or disagree with what you will we've learned from from the past for the past I think nine years or so. I released it in 2011, but I started to make it in 2010. So it's nine, 10 years, so whew, a long time. If you had a kid that was that small, it will become that small in 10 years, you know? So keep that in mind. It's a very long time. Uh, we stream on Facebook and YouTube, unfortunately, but we will try to stream on other sources if we have the opportunity to do so. I think PeerTube, which is a peer-to-peer platform for video streaming will implement some sort of live streaming in the next months or so so we are trying that but if you want to ask questions and participate so if you want to participate you go to drumsite.com slash chat and you can participate video or audio or you can write write us questions there question there um and two more things um if you want to support Trump documentary, not Trump documentary, Trump project, the entire project, because we are more than a documentary right now, we do more than that, a lot more than that. You can go to drumside.com slash donate. Is We don't give any perks or any shit like that. It's just like, if you want to support, you support, you know, as, as simple as that. And uh, yeah, the format of this uh, Trumpcast is um, we take a main subject, we discuss it, and then at the beginning or at the end of it, we discuss, discuss some Trump curated news, because we have this tool at trumpside.com slash tools, we create lots of stuff. And uh, this time, maybe we will start with um, uh, dissecting of Trump documentary because this video will be posted on the documentary page on, on Trump site as a, like a disclaimer or warning or whatever. So if people un like also watch this video to see if something changed, you know, for the past 10 years or so. Okay, so we have... Um, we have Cody, and we have Sasha, and we have Jen, and we have Alex, and we have Theo. <laughs> and um, we can start and discuss the Trom documentary. Let's bash this motherfucker. You know, let's 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 trash it. <laughs> let's let's see. I took some notes here. Oh, geez. let's. Oh my god. <laughs> notes. <sighs> oh, notes, my friend. You're going deep into this. Uh, All right. And I will, I will, we can bring, you know, part by part and discuss, you know, in oh, general yeah. about, the, about those subjects, you know. Oh, yeah. So, what if you can bring the science part of Trump documentary? Science. And I'll, I'll start with the bashing and you guys can, can follow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, good. It's not going to be all about bashing, it's going to be like just explaining how I, I was thinking about the documentary and how I think now. For that, what are the facts now and so forth? Okay, so the science one. So my idea with the documentary was first to showcase how we know about the world. Like, how do we know shit? Like, how do we know that what we are, what is the world, and so forth? And the best tool that we have, of course, it's science. So for me, it was like I think it's it's important to start with science. You know, what is science? But of course. You know, back then in 2000, whatever, then I didn't know, I knew a lot less than now about science, of course. And I now I will make it a lot more, a lot bigger, like a lot more expanded because it didn't say a lot more. I just said that, you know, science is the best tool that we have. And uh, of course, I, I still agree with that. 10 years later, <laughs> surprise, surprise. I'm happy that I still agree <laughs> with that fucking thing. <laughs> science is the best tool that we, that we have. But it's not a big video. It's uh, it's more like a fun, fun video to to watch. I just put maybe there a, a segment of um, explaining how math mathematics probably was invented, you know, and how useful it is. So yeah, I think it it aged well that the video, that part of the documentary. But um, I think it's too brief. That would be my my criticism, you know. 
and also I started by saying that um, you know we have you see the world with your five senses. Of course, there are there are these are main five senses that are kind recognized. There are other kinds of senses, but you can always divide them into even more and more senses and and so forth. You know, that's maybe a small criticism if it's a criticism. I don't know, but it was a bit too brief. And uh, another thing that we will discuss more and more about uh, will be something that I quite disagree with right now. Uh, I said that, uh, you know, science is, let's see, science is uh, like physics and mathematics. Our languages are not, not, not subject to interpretation, you know, and we probably we should use those because of that. I thought that mathematics, physics, chemistry, because of the language itself, like chemistry and so forth, so forth, they're not subject to interpretation, but maybe let's keep that for the language part because we can discuss more about this. So if you guys want to add up add something about that science part, that's my criticism mainly. It was too briefly, too brief, you know, should be a lot bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to make a section on science in the next documentary? <clears throat> well, that's another that's thing, because uh, uh, for those who don't know, I will, make the single part of Trump, of Trump documentary, you know, so whatever we bash here, it's an improvement on, on the <laughs> next documentary, basically. Uh, yeah, I think I should I should do that. My my idea was to first write a book about science, because I would be, I'll go a lot deeper into the subject. So maybe I will semi write, a, not a book, but for the script about science and explaining what science is. It's difficult. It's difficult to explain what science is because it's so, it, it it differs from one um, uh, uh, part, one one like branch. like medicine like branch, yeah. medicine, uh, physics, uh, whatever you want to do. It, it depends how you make clinical trials, how you study things, what you study, what questions you ask. But in general, is science is uh, uh, like you have to investigate and test a hypothesis, and then others should independently test the same hypothesis and see if you can arrive at the same conclusions, you know, briefly, you know, what do you guys think science is, for example? Yeah, I would say it's more of a, a method of finding out what, what the, tr what reality is, or a method to finding out the answers to your questions about the world. Yeah, and just like separating facts from bias, you know, trying to, trying to, like, put on a pair of glasses where you're not human anymore and your your own biases aren't getting in the way of you know just seeing the facts facts don't care about your feelings no <laughs> <laughs> i mean look at yeah. the united states we're <laughs> we're a mess <laughs> nobody here science cares doesn't that. work there huh? no. <laughs> science. <laughs> they, can, they can literally get up on a podium and tell you like the science is in the way of our Economy. Trying to open the economy or whatever, you know, of our jobs. <laughs> it's just like... Yeah. yeah, science education, it's uh, not only like, uh, yes, it's important to educate children to know what science is, but it's a, it should be a constant process of, because even if you learn in school for 12 years, it's easy to get misled online today. There are some, like, delve into, for example, the flat earth, people who think that the earth is flat, they will have lots and doc of documents or lots of bullshit there. For some people it might be a bit overwhelming, you know, it might look like, oh, maybe they have good evidence for this shit, you know, because they look like that. So you have to ha also have to, it has to be a constant process, right? And always ask, where is the information coming from? Whenever someone says something like, oh, Coca-Cola causes ulcer or whatever the fuck causes people to become gay, right? <laughs> Let's see, where do you get that from? How do you say Coca-Cola makes people gay, right? First, you show me some studies, then you define what gay is, then you see who replicated that, what were the results, what are the interpretation and so forth. So it's very important to always ask, where is the information coming from? Doesn't matter the information, what is the information, but where does it come from? This is very important, of course. <laughs> Yeah, that's why I like those articles that really break down studies, because before that, I didn't realize, like, when I would read an article, it would say, studies show that this is looking promising, but then you don't realize, like, okay, what were the studies done? You know, it might be a 
trial done on three people, which is like one is your mom, your brother, and your best friend, or so, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you don't really know what the study is. So it teaches you to, uh, you know, investigate even the article that you're reading and, and double check it to make sure that that's even accurate. So I think a lot of people even don't even read articles. They just read a headline and then they're like, oh, you know, because everything's based off of clicking on something or sensationalism or whatever the biggest um, topic is of the moment that's going to get people's attention and get them excited and get them to share it. You know, it's not about the facts or, you know, like, with vaccines or like even the coronavirus situation, how people are like herd immunity. And it's like, that doesn't even exist. Like stop saying it right now because it's, until it's, it's a, it's like something that we can look forward to right now. It's still something they're investigating. You know, I, I think people don't understand that it is a process and that it, it really, I think that's what makes science so exciting is that it's not a, like a destination. It's, it's a constant, it's like traveling, you know, you're, you're constantly moving and it's exciting. It's not just like, Oh, we just arrived here and now it's done. You know, <laughs> done. <laughs> it, it also matters a lot about the, the domain of science. When you, uh, even you as a, as a like observer, you read the studies directly to know if it's relevant, what you read, like going to science medicine, you may not be, able to understand if it's this this study is relevant or not if you're not familiar with how studies are done in medicine you know it's different from how studies are done in physics for example or or investigative s s science is done in other domains you know so that's also something that I, I've learned for the past 10 or so years after reading a lot from medicine I think it's a very fascinating uh, domain of science because it deals with hu human beings directly it deals with such a dynamic uh creature that that humans are like our diet like that's why they can never say exactly okay what is good to eat they have like approximations because it's such a dynamic uh fucking field right this the health or, or genes like or are genes going to make you have a like a, a heart problems in, in in the future or not they they don't know it's an and how do you make a study to 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 observe this well i will not be able to make a study to observe that a physicist will not be able probably to make a study to observe that so that's why it's good to also have uh experts in different fields because you you cannot focus i know this idea of like oh we need generalist people that's great for like people who observe the world you know but you also need i, I would say specialists in sp different domains so they know exactly to focus on on those specific parts of science right else it will be a, a, a mix you know of, of a lot of information that humans are not capable of processing of course with the help of com computers and so forth you can do better like clinical trials testing of medicine and so forth yeah but i think it's very important to to say that science is not really one thing it's it's a method but it's it depends what you're trying to study right at the core of it is like experiments and people should repeat those experiments because you cannot have just one clinical trial or experiment others independently have to do that right and come with the same conclusions or if they come with the same conclusions that it's a much more solid theory maybe it's like it's, it's a fact and that's how it works so i learned a lot for the past 10 years like, what science is back then i didn't know a lot but uh yeah it opens your eyes about oh my god it's such a complicated world of, of science it's not like a one thing it's yeah <laughs> i also think that the way our culture views science is kind of fucked up because you know when you're a kid you're taught science in school and then when you become an adult it's like oh you have no business you're not a science like kind of i think that humans are are scientists naturally uh, it's our society that makes us less scientific, you know, we're, we're naturally curious creatures, but we're taught not like we're taught, like, for instance, my brother and I were having a conversation and um, I asked him where he got, got his facts from. And he told me it was like, in reference to the coronavirus, where it's a global 
situation. He's only looking at statistics from Ohio, which is where we live. And I was like, but this is a global thing. You can't just look at Ohio and summarize off of that. And then he kind of threw it in my face that he has a degree in science and I don't. (laughs) Therefore, you know, and I was like, well, I can read. I have internet. (laughs) What's your point? (laughs) You know, it's just kind of that thinking that, oh, I don't have any business knowing about this or that. And so people just feel, I guess, intimidated by it or less curious. I don't know. Maybe maybe school also pushes people away from wanting to like delve into science because they see it as just like, oh, it was just this thing that I was taught in school. And then once they finish school, if they don't Mm -hmm. go into science, studying sciences further and making a career out of it, most people kind of like brush it aside. Yeah, like they're taught it's it's useless. School thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and let's be let's let's be honest. uh, uh, We we cannot really do science as we are observers we can interpret science most of the time you are not of course you're not able there are big teams doing uh, the proper science i would say so you know in a sense we are just the ones we, we choose we, we trust we make connections and so forth we learn but in the end it's also a matter a lot of trust there like you trust nasa you don't investigate climate change because you cannot you can you can read about studies you know and you make a correlation there and say, okay, I suppose climate change is real and this is what climate change is. But in the end, you didn't do any study. Of course, we rely on other people that are experts in their field to do those studies, you know? And if you lack trust, which, which we do in this society, and people are like, oh, but the companies may, may, may have uh, given money to this, this researchers to, to, to study sugar, for example, if Coca-Cola spon- sponsors a team of scientists to, for fuck's sake to, to study sugar and they fucking sell sugar drinks, mm-hmm. of course you are skeptical, like, what the fuck, right? So people don't trust in this society, don't trust s- science, they will call it like that, because they cluster all of this together. So it's a bit of a difficult situation for us here, observers, you know, we just have to cherry pick in a way what we trust, that's how I see things, like, I don't know how else I can interpret the world from the from the back of my my computer, from behind my computer, uh, rather than other than just reading through the science news and articles and trusting that NASA did a good job or or cancer research okay or whoever about this drug and, and so forth. So I think that's also important. We we trust. We have to trust science. We are scientists in a way that, like Jen was saying, maybe we are curious, right? But proper science is done with big teams of people and over a long period of time. And it's something that is difficult to do. Like it's extremely difficult. How do we discover, uh, like one time they're looking at um, the sun and they realize that, you know, energy and mass are, are kind of the same. They realize that whatever comes out of the sun, you know, like uh, uh, one atom is not, doesn't equal them the mass and the energy that it dissipates doesn't, that doesn't match the, the calculation at home. So it has to be other particle there that's, that's, we cannot detect, right? So we had to, they had to invent this fucking big machine, the Lash Hadron, Hadron Collider or others back then, you know, to to smash protons together and see if there are other practicals. It's something that we cannot do. We cannot even arrive mm-hmm. at the conclusion mm-hmm. unless we have these big fucking machines and tens of thousands of scientists. So I think it's very important to point out, you know, science is, we are, in a, we are very far away from Aristotle, very far, far away from Plato and from even Darwin and Galileo and even Einstein. I think you will rarely find today these kind of geniuses that will come with uh, all kinds of breakthroughs because science became so complicated. You need big machines, big groups of scientists and big studies you know, to arrive at some conclusions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's very dynamic and complex, but at the same time, that shouldn't stop people from being science minded and knowing what to be skeptical about. And then when, when, like you said, to trust, because, you know. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And Alex, if you ever want to say something, feel free, feel free to, to just say stuff, interrupt us. Don't be, don't be too friendly. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, uh, for some reason I, I've been like, hearing you a bit muffled from time to time i i'm not sure like whether it's on on which end is it because my speed okay, connection but then i like it, what how is it coded for you 
Uh, yeah, I see him as like, uh, I mean, he's disconnected. You've disconnected a couple times and stuff. So, I mean. So I think it's your, it's a problem there. Yeah, yeah. It would seem to be. Yeah. It seems to be. That's how it's You, see, you seem okay right now. Fine, so I, I'm, I'm not sure what what's up. Yeah, but it's. You my, can my leave just the audio if you want. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You can leave well, just the audio works. so you don't make. Okay, now. Yeah. Are you able to hear me well? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think science is, uh, well, like science is a lot of things, obviously, uh, but uh, one of the purposes of science is to be able to predict the outcomes of events. Okay, for example, like the simplest thing is you do experiment, and if you understand the theory well enough and you have the, the models, you can predict what would be the outcome of that experiment, and that might be useful for a lot of things in our daily life, right? So like making a machine that, that uh, this predictable, okay? Like if it, whether it's a tool or a computer or a satellite, then you know how it would behave. Uh, then you can do something that's reliable and many people can use it. So like that's one of the main, I think, purposes of why we discover science, why we work on it, why we, you know, use it uh, to develop stuff. Yeah, that's like maybe something. Yeah, yeah, that, that's an important point about um, prediction is something that when I wanted to write the book about science, I think my main focus will have been how science is actually how to, to predict. We have to, if you if you cannot predict this religion, almost like it's uh, it's something you cannot really use. If you cannot predict stuff with it, you know, it will be a chaos. If you cannot predict that this building is going to stand earthquakes from this magnitude to this magnitude or whatever, or just stand or rebuild it, you cannot fucking do anything right in this work. So it's a very important point. Yeah, science is about allowing us to predict, predict our future, predict what we should or should not do or could or could not do, you know, mm -hmm. and it's important. Yep. So if you don't, if, if you don't want to add anything about science guys, we can go tonight. We have 37 parts. Okay. That's just it. so you know. <laughs> yeah, that was just one out of the 37. That was just one. Move on. <laughs> we can move on. One, the, the, the discussion one. is going to be as long as the Trump documentary itself. Yeah, let's not. <laughs> let's not do it. But speaking of science, the next thing that I wanted to showcase is um, what's our place in uh, in this world based on what we know from science. And I made this, this part called evolution of everything. How basically everything evolved from the Big Bang to us now. And I think this is still a relevant and factual as far as I can tell. Uh, video, though it's one part there that is, uh, I, I put the um, uh, string theory, you know, in, in there and it's not, it's just, it's disputed if it's, that's how it is, like those little strings vibrating and then they create these particles, we, they don't know. So it's not even in the good books of scientific theories there, it is, it's one of the yeah. theories. But the rest, I think it's based on what we know, even today it's still, kind of okay that th th part and i think it's nice to just put it in a in just a few minutes to put a, the entire evolution to see that okay we are not just here now we've we are part of something a lot bigger than this and it will continue with or without us you know and we are basically stardust like others are saying or recycled earth material because imagine everybody who dies or who burns on this planet is just recycled earth very little stuff is lost from the earth or comes like in forms of asteroids, meteors you know, on, on the planet. So it's interesting to put it like that. I hope that if I put it like that, people will have a bit of, I don't know, a mental, a bit of a mental, sh shake their minds a bit like, hey, you know, look what we are and let's discuss our society from this, this perspective. You know, I think it's a more realistic way than just be so trapped in the society that you cannot see anything else. You know, you seem like changing something at a grand scale seems impossible. So I I hoped that that this video will make people yeah will make people understand what they are. You know. Yeah, um, maybe to not be trapped in this you know idea of like rather than I'm a human on this planet. You know, most people think <laughs> oh I'm a doctor, I'm a teacher, I'm a fashion critic or I'm this and that so trapped in this <laughs> mentality of jobs and careers and small mindedness. I'm an American, I'm a Chinese and whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. 
when I met Trom, I, I hoped that um, these kinds of videos, because I was making these kinds of videos in a Romanian language, because I'm from Romania originally, and I made this kind of video. So I hope that if I make these videos and expose this reality, people kind of, it kind of makes uh, all of this bullshit that we live today, like social statuses and money and all that, a bit more transparent, a bit more unimportant, but it, does, it doesn't quite work like that, apparently, you know? If you tell someone, I, I remember when I kind of discovered the atoms, I'm like, I was telling my parents, oh my God, are you crazy? Everything is made out of atoms. <laughs> That's mind blowing. Almost like it, it makes irrelevant all of the jobs and so forth, just for a little bit on this, you know? But it seems like they don't quite react. It's like, yeah, yeah, sure. But to me, it's not like that. To me, it's like, are you crazy? It's, if that is true. That it means that we are a lot more than we are told in the society. You know, we are part of a much bigger picture. That should make you rethink a little bit your values. But I, it's not as easy as that, you know. <laughs> well. Yeah, because they've been shaped for so long, and it's like, you know, you say that to most people, and they're like, "Oh yeah, I learned about that in science class." So yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and then I remembered my my chemistry teacher was a very religious person, like super religious. I never quite understood the stupidity of this fact up until later on. But then I was like, "Oh my god, if she, knowing so much about chemistry, you know, and how basically lives life forms and develops and so forth." Ah, oh, is she so religious? Oh my God, that's bad. <laughs> it means that it's not the amount of information is overall the environment of, of someone who cha that changes them. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I think that when you look at it from a global perspective and just seeing how small we are in the universe, it's like humbling. And like I said in the last article I wrote, it's liberating to think of it that way. I, I think it kind of relieves a lot of pressure that the society puts on you, but maybe because so many people have so much pressure on them. And in a lot of cases, you know, they're just living these awful lives just because all the stress that they, they look to religion, you know, even though they may not in the back of their mind, they may know like, okay, this doesn't really do me any good, but somehow it, it's like a stress relief for them or comfort zone. I don't know. Yes, and you come from a society where you are taught about these imaginary stories and then movies and then it's an entertainment kind of thing. It's an ad, a big ad, mm -hmm. you know. So I think it's hard for them to click with science, this kind of science facts, you know. They live in, I, I know very well, I was living inside movies basically for all of my high school period of time. I loved movies, I loved these stories and so forth. Maybe it wouldn't work for me either to just tell me these so-called boring things. But once I got the idea that, oh my God, these things are real. Movies are just, of course I understood movies, movies are not real, but it's, uh, people are used to explosions. And it's like shocking things and science most of the time it's, it's amazing, but it's more like slowly moving, slowly like discoveries are slower. It's not like, like every week a fucking new breakthrough, you know? If that's the science uh, news that you're following, then you should stop following the fucking shit because <laughs> science is not, a, there is not a breakthrough every week. Okay. Yeah. So the yeah. evolution. Yeah. Yeah. I think our culture is just like, so, since it's so heavily based on consumerism, everything's like disposable, quick, mm -hmm. have an instant gratification. So that's what they, you know, when science is like a continual process, it's not instantly gratifying like a movie or, TV show or something like that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the evolution of everything, I think it's, yeah, they just put a light on that huge, like huge evolution. They just condensed into like 10, 10, 15 minutes or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I think it's also this uh, video with uh, Richard Dawkins explaining in a very ni nice way that if the evolution of humans was like. I don't know the, the length of this his stretch arms and the dinosaurs are from the elbow to the tip of their finger of his finger and the entire human history like the written one from like jesus and whatever for the past ten thousand years is just like a, if you take a nail polish and you polish your finger fingernail no, whatever drops yeah whatever drops there that dust that's the entire history of humans you know i like when people put it in this kind of way it's like, okay. <laughs> yeah Expectivo. 
yeah so the conclusion is evolution never happened it's a fucking uh, it's it's a it's a conspiracy it's a hoax. no <laughs> it's not <laughs> okay what do we have here so after i explained the evolution and so forth i want to focus more on like what influences human behavior because if you talk about the society but you don't talk about human behavior then what are you talking about you know because it's all about humans here humans kill other humans humans pollute humans go to space or rape humans invent religions and science you know it's all about humans so what is about this human behavior what makes us good or bad or or whatever like why why do i have want to work without wanting money and others want money you know so i wanted to focus on this environment part because i think it's such an important uh, important piece of this grand grand pie you know I, and i think it doesn't work without that it's almost like wanting to to, to bake some some cookie without uh, without an oven or without electricity you know or something like that it just doesn't quite work you need to talk about humans so in part of the environment uh i think it aged quite well i i it's something i just don't disagree with still uh, years later after people sent me all kinds of like oh no but genes play a very important part oh no but the brain structure after reading so many scientific papers listening to all kinds of lectures and so forth i still don't find that evidence anywhere like human being human behavior is ultimately influenced by the environment i mean even even so-called beasts you know like uh, say lions or whatever animals you know depends where they grow because you can have an animal you look at circus you know i don't like what they're doing there with the animals mm. but for fuck's sakes if you see a bear riding a bicycle and then a fucking elephant singing something on like a trumpet or some shit like that's a that's a different behavior than in the wild it means that the environment doesn't matter what you are predisposed to in terms of behaviors the environment will always change that and uh, maybe that's one th the single one thing that i disagree in this video that i, I said that uh, humans might be predisposed or are predisposed to certain behaviors but even if that's the case then the environment overrides that i don't even think it's even uh correct to say people are predisposed to certain behaviors because i haven't read anything about that and and as an example i give the, the, here the feral children example i think this is the best the most unfortunate but the best example in terms of human behavior like look what happens to a human being who is put in an extreme environment you don't see any kinds of like oh empathy or being social or not social or just they don't react they can't even walk properly or talk or just don't react you know and i give an example of genie <laughs> And another girl uh, and i think these are powerful examples and whoever talks about changing the society and i'm talking about tvp i'm talking about tzm i'm talking about others you should really start to use these examples because they're extremely important like like look what happens when the environment puts a human being in in extreme situations because think about it we have the largest experiment uh, like billions of people you want to analyze their behavior if you were to make a study to analyze human behavior you'll take like a thousand babies or two million babies and put them in different environments and see and control those environments some is very greedy like competitive some is very cooperative to see how this develops but of course you are not like hitler to come up with such fucking plan that would be quite bad you know but you have the world so you can look at different cultures over years and you can look at these extreme examples over years you know rafa sent me recently another interesting case about the feral child here in spain actually is this kid who was kind of sold as a slave in the 50s or 60s to this farmer and this farmer died or something and the kid at seven years old he just left that farm and he grew with wolves and and birds for 12 years 12 years he grew it like it's a very well documented case for, for from anthropologists here in spain unfortunately mostly most is in spanish uh, he grew with them and then he developed their behaviors for imagine have 12 years and then the police found the, the, this, this kid he was 19 by then and he just he attacked the police to, to bite them and he was howling like a wolf and he had the behaviors of wolves you know and then they brought him back to civilization and uh, you know yes they taught him how to walk again how to get integrated in the society but he said at one point because this guy is very in the media uh, even it's even alive today 
uh, he said that he doesn't quite like this society. He said I, he would like to kind of go back. He doesn't like this too much noise. It's like too like, crazy things happening. He liked to be him and with his wolves or something just all alone in, in, in the woods. So that's another example, you know, how environment makes it be whatever, I think, right? Yeah, you can study all across the world um, in terms of inequality and, and how it pushes people's behaviors. And like in the United States, that we're the most unequal society. So we have a lot more violence here. I think another um, good, but also very sad uh, example is uh, these like kids that go into schools and do mass shootings or just mass shootings in general. You know, it's always their environment. They always have some type of history of abuse or you know, some extreme, extreme situation that pushes them to behave like that. Yeah, it's like murderers and rapists. I mean, I don't think you'll find many that haven't had, you know, mm -hmm. some really huge traumatic situations in their childhood and their lives. You know, it's always the environment that influences them to have this kind of behavior. So. Yeah. Yeah, and you can take the earth as like a big experiment. Look at the environment and look at how people within that environment behave. Mm -hmm. so. Maybe Sasha's mic is too low. Do you think, you think Cody? Uh, the no, I, I hear okay. Oh, okay. Gunner. Yeah, I mean. Okay, Alex. <laughs> I didn't know about this feature that you can raise your hand. Oh, yeah, yeah apparently. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a very polite feature. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if people are paying attention, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, well, uh, so so um, I agree with everything that, that you said so far. Um, I, I think that um, it can be confusing sometimes when, pe when people use the word environment in a totalistic manner, like, okay, environment influences everything. So my people think of it as that, for example, now I'm in this environment, so it would totally determine what I would do next. Uh, but when, when usually, well, what, what stands behind what you're usually saying is that, well, past environment influences me, influenced me and make me what I am now and current environment in addition would also influence what I'm current, what I'm going to do next. But it's sort of a combination of all the, my past experience and my, uh, existing environment right now. Okay. My present environment. Okay. And sort of what was. In the past, it's sort of what people call, call maybe a character or whatever, or you know, my mind or my brain. Uh, so all of my you know past experiences sort of mesh together into my uh, my uh, my brain or what's stored in my brain, and that in combination with my current environment. For example, I'm sitting on a chair, I see the screen, I touch the keyboard. So that environment in conjunction with the previous environment then dictate what would happen next, what what I'm going to do next. Right, sort of. Yeah, uh, and I think that's. Yeah, I think that's what we all mean. Also, by environment is also, yeah, the past environment, everything you've been exposed to. Yeah. I mean, it's I also this, yeah. yeah. Sorry. I was yeah. just gonna say, I think even babies in the womb, like if their parents are stressed out, it might, you know, in turn make them more stressed out or have more anxiety. Um, you know, obviously, like if a parent's smoking and drinking when a baby's in the womb, that can affect you know, it's all sorts of things that could then make them behave differently than another person in the same environment, you know, 20 years later. I'm, this is what uh, I'm quite skeptical about, to be honest. Like, I have seen this in Sapolsky. Usually he made popularized all kinds of, because someone asked in the Trump chat about Sapolsky and B.F. Skinner and so forth. Uh, some people refer to the environment as also like this epigenetic kind of thing. Uh, or something in the environment changes our biology and our biology influences the way that we behave, which I, I just, I kind of disagree with because I don't, you show me some studies where it showcases that the biology, doesn't matter I created this biology, but the biology make people uh, depressed, make people uh, more suicidal, make people more happy or more pe make people more competitive. I'm, I'm curious, what's the connection between that bi biology, whatever that means? and the behavior itself because it, it, like we discussed about science we should be able to predict it if that's the case then we should look at people's genes or we should be, be able to look at people's stress levels in the womb or should be and should be, should be able to predict and as far as i know there is nothing more than some correlations but it's difficult 
to, to say that even in case of people with schizophrenia, which is a so-called mental disease that is one of the most uh, expressful, maybe let's say, of, of them all, uh, it, it depends where this, you cannot trace it back to like of families of uh, like, oh, you had the schizophrenia in your family, it's very likely to have kids with schizophrenia. And even if you trace that, it could be the environment. There is no connection between, oh, it's something biological it means. So I'm still, I. I, I don't, I, I can't disagree with Sapolsky, whatever he says, because sometimes when he said something, I, I, I just paused the video and I look for the study. It was a, like a very small study of just a few people and a lot of interpretations there and not replicated and so forth. So I'm just saying from what I know about the world, I don't think it's something biological that will determine or even influence greatly a behavior. And some extreme examples could be the Down syndrome or the Williams syndrome, something like Williams or something, but the Down syndrome, you can say, okay, we we recognize some genes there. We recognize some, like people with Down syndrome also look differently. So we can predict how, but can you predict how the behavior of kids with Down syndrome will be? Because even in this extreme case, when you know a lot about, it's quite difficult to predict. You know, the, I've seen all kinds of cases of kids with Down syndrome being extremely so-called smart, I say so-called smart because in society, I don't know what that means to be smart, but by the standards to be smart or to be funny or to be very social, some are very anxious and so forth. So that's my input here. I don't know, that's my input. <laughs> yeah, I guess well, if, you, if we put, uh, well, what I said about you know, your past experiments, your current environment, that uh, where do you put your body? Because it's sort of, is it part of the environment? Some people say, okay, everything that's outside your brain, that's part of the environment. So if, for example, you have a stomach ache, it would affect your behavior, right? If you have like chronic pain, okay, that would affect obviously your behavior because there, you, it would be very difficult for you to concentrate, to do stuff, to be social and stuff like that. So stuff like that that are biological, some people would say that everything that's outside the brain is part of the environment and then you treat it like anything else in the environment. And some would say just a third thing, okay, you have your, your brain or you know, your neural state, you have your current environment, okay, and you have your body, okay, but obviously the body can affect your behavior, sometimes, you know, slightly, sometimes more if you're, whatever, if you decap, like if you have, don't have your arms or don't have your feet or you have like very severe pain, obviously that, that might greatly affect your, your behavior in these cases, okay, which is not a you know, general case. Yeah, I agree with that. But what I'm saying is that whatever is there, like oh, stomach ache, or it can be, it can be maybe another kinds of all kinds of physical problems, or beer. It's also something that you put in your body and influences your mm -hmm. behavior. But in all of these cases, I don't think you can predict very well. Even with beer, you cannot say that oh, all people who drink beer will be happy. Some people are not happy. Some people are quite pissed off. I've been to this kind of discourse back in my youth, and then people are fighting all the time, or fighting over like when they are drunk. You know, a stomach ache. Yes, I have problems with my stomach all the time. I have a very weak stomach in that sense. I just like I cannot eat only some certain foods. Maybe that stopped me from traveling and so forth. But there are other people with my kind of problems, maybe very similar, that do not care as much or influence them in different ways. So what I'm saying is, if in the end, it's all about your overall experience. Yes. You are your body and your mind, you are everything. And yes, then when we talk about the environment, we talk about everything. But I think the culture, the 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 culture, you know, it influences how you deal with whatever, from pain to to pleasure. It's so it's it can give so many examples of people who have similar kind of diseases that are chronic pain from chronic pain to whatever other uh, diseases, or they cannot sense the taste of food or cannot see color and so forth. And even in those people, you see differences in terms of how they interpret th that problem, you know? So even if there is an, an, a, a slight uh, influence, I don't know if it's big enough to, to drive, to, to, for us to be able to predict. Can we say that people with chronic pain are, are less friendly? Uh, it seems a bit reasonable, so-called, but is it true? Like, I would love to read some science about this. Is it true, you know? So, yeah, I think that, well, A, nothing is absolute, either zero or one, obviously. Uh, so uh, I don't think that, uh, I don't think no one thinks that, you know, your body would totally determine your behavior, or, okay, or your biology would totally determine what you would do. It's sort of a combination of things. And uh, I, I also agree that there's no, like, uh, I don't think there's anything that environment cannot 
fix, okay, or cannot modify because environment is very, very versatile. You have a lot of freedom in what you do with the environment, okay? Like if you're missing an arm, it's very difficult to add an arm, but you know, you can make the environment so your arm wouldn't be necessary, okay? Uh, so it's much more easy to, to modify the environment than the physical body at the moment, okay? So there are many more solutions or adaptations you can do using the environment, uh, which you cannot do with the body. Okay, and maybe you can do almost anything with the environment while with the body you're very limited because it's only, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a closed system sort of. Okay, it can help you, it, it, it mo help you become more mobile, it, it mobilizes you, you can move from place to place, right? And it supports your structure and it gives you like oxygen and stuff like that, but that's the far as it goes. Okay, an environment can do a lot more. Okay, you can read a book, okay, and learn something new because you're exposed to a library but you cannot discover this knowledge just by internal in your body, okay? So there's much more potential of influence by the environment rather than physical things that are contained in your body. That's sort of what I think. Yeah, in the, in the end, we are uh, concerned mainly with uh, this kind of obvious behaviors that are, of course, coming from culture, like people hating the others because of the color of their skin. People want to make more profit. People, maybe you can find some extreme behaviors like the, I don't know, Down syndrome, I don't know any other, uh, like where the biology is, is definitely something, an impairment, or maybe the opposite of an impairment. But overall, people's values come from the environment. It's not like you are born with something, some values, or you're predisposed to be this or that. I, I, don't, I don't know what to say more than show me what kind of evidence is there, because I can show you millions probably of examples of people from all around, like from all, all history that have different kinds of be behaviors based on different kinds of environments. So if you see the same kind of humans being able to kill and others like puke when, even when they see blood, I think that's mostly a culture, cultural uh, uh, influence than a biological influence. Somehow we are born to be like, uh, disgusting, to feel disgusted towards blood, you know. Oh, what about the Nazis, you know? Apparently, they were like genetically engineered or more predisposed mm -hmm. to like kill other people and enjoy fucking doing that. You know, I don't think so. Just because they are put in that environment, or like okay, going to war and I have to listen to orders and shoot people, and it's fine if you do that. Yeah, so. absolutely. I mean, I think environment overall is is the main determining factor, but I don't see how. And maybe I'm wrong. I can check and see, but um, you know, like a. a baby that has a brain developing in the womb, they can still have anxiety if the mother's experiencing anxiety. I don't, I mean, that could make them react in an anxious way throughout their life. Or if, you know, at a very young age, they're just always exposed to these extreme situations. Like if, if your parents are always yelling at you, you're probably going to be, you know, the type of person that yells a lot as an adult. I don't know. Yeah, but when you say like stress may influence the mother and the mother may influence the, the kid in the womb, that's basically like talking about the biochemical influence in a way, like the stress levels. We know, in, in the we kid. know when uh, people are stressed, like cortisol is released in the brain and it does have an effect on their biological, um, you know, that's like uh, could cause them to develop um, heart disease, hypertension, um, you know, it does lead to, to biological changes. Now, I'm not saying that that's the main thing, but, um, I think overall environment and, and in fact, that is the environment that is the environment still in that situation that is still environment, you know, environment is the most important thing. The, okay. But I, I yeah, she you. the, the Dutch hung, hunger winter, isn't that? Uh, a clip in one of these uh, episodes where the um, uh, if you were like a, a second or third trimester baby and like their food supply was cut off and, and basically their bodies adapted to be super stingy with sh sugars and, and stuff that there was this uh, genetic consequence to that environmental setting. But in terms of behavior, I mean? Uh, I guess... Uh, I'm just trying to relate to like Jen's like having having these like cortisol levels like what your mom uh, is going through is affecting like those those same those cortisol it's going through you kind of thing and then yeah, what is what is that doing yeah. yeah right that that 
that's your environment that uh, you were stressed as a as a unborn child kind of thing and um, the environmental consequences of, of such a thing. No, I agree that if the mother smokes and there are all kinds of studies showing that the kid's health might be in danger because of some reasons, probably same with, with stress because you can identify what stress is at the biological level. But I don't see how that influences the kid's behavior in his life when he is subjected to his to whatever culture is subjected to like where is the connection there i don't know because i yeah it's a very complex thing i think it's one small piece of the the puzzle you know there obviously all of your experiences throughout life like me and my siblings all grew up in the same household but we're all completely different people and then say like if you have to people from different backgrounds and you put them in the prison and they're in prison for the same exact amount of time, they're still going to react differently, even though overall they might um, uh, adapt to that environment, they're still going to be different in a way because of all their past experiences. I don't know. Uh, uh, like, um, uh, wasn't Jacques was given the example of, uh, like having two kids and you take one and like put them on your, on your knee or whatever, like you could have twins kind of thing. And just these little, mm -hmm. these little discrepancies can like really, I mean, that kid could start holding a grudge kind of thing. And like, I mean, like the little changes in the environment. Yeah. Right. Just these, the these little tweaks. And then you carry all the little tweaks that, that, I mean, they have that butterfly effect kind of chaos um later on down the road yeah so even if you're two siblings born in one family you're still exposed to very different environments hmm. based on your friends based on your experience in school based on were you bitten by a dog at some point were you you know stung by a bee yep. were you this were you that you know yeah and then you get yeah a very different set of behaviors and stuff like <laughs> yeah alex you want to say something uh yeah so um i think that uh well sort of what Jen said and, and what, I'm sorry, I don't know the name of Flingafu. Oh, uh, yeah, or Cody Flingafu, Cody. whatever. What's your name? Cody Flingafu, whatever. It's um, Cody, okay, yeah, sorry, yeah. yeah. Uh, so so what, what Cody said sort of uh, 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 that, you know, you cannot create exactly the same environment, right, for, for people that are sort of the same. Like even if you take twins, you know, and they live in the same home, they don't go through the same uh, experiences right so it's it's impossible to create the same environment that's why making this kind of an experiment when you take sort of a, exactly the same person which are twins maybe and then you try to put them through the exact environment you won't get the same result obviously because they go to a slightly different environment one of them might meet some person that the other one didn't one of them might hit their hand and it hurts or whatever so uh, and then it propagates like sort of a butterfly effect, right? So s subtle differences might, you know, result in different uh, de uh, evolvement with time. And so there's that. Um, uh, and there's also like um, uh, sort of if you have some biological difference, okay? Like if you, or, or you have some biological event where you're exposed to the cortisol in the womb, or you broke your leg when you were little and stuff like that. So these things can affect your eventual behavior in the future to some extent, uh, though it is limited, you know, depending on, on what happened. Like if you became paralyzed, it would obviously affect your <laughs> behavior very much. If you know, if you just broke your finger, maybe not that much, maybe you would be more afraid from playing in the playground, right? But uh, uh, it, that effect would be probably limited. Uh, but I would also say that with designing the, pro the, the, the right environment, you can sort of cancel out all of these effects, okay, which is maybe what, I don't know if Tia what, or, what meant by this is the more, more determ determining factor that you can take almost any person with any sort of past experience and you can submer submerge them in an environment that would affect their behavior and sort of correct or change the previous effects that were that resulted from those cortisol levels or that finger that was broken or some other things. And in that sense, the environment has more potential or, or the potential to be more potent if you control for it, right? If you just throw those people in the, in the, in the world, then maybe those small changes in their past or in a, uh, you know, would propagate and become something bigger. But if you design that environment that they're in, you can 
make sure that those effects are negligible in the test effects. Yeah, and also, yeah. I, think yeah. uh, I think there's like a lot of studies on children that grow up in like um, lower income households. They um, show that their learning capabilities are a lot less than like, say somebody that grows up in a very nurturing environment. Um, so it does shape, it does shape. Um, I mean, I don't, I think that overall environment, which again, the environment is the most important factor in that equation. And then, you know, in the long run environment can change that behavior. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that they're incapable of it, but um, I think it does show that there is some biologic, like um, some kind of, um, you know, psychological effect on that. Yeah, I, I would say again that uh, if you look at, if you need an experiment, I don't want to put it in that light, but but that's what I know. We know for sure the people with the Down syndrome, we know for sure if someone will say, okay, I will tweak those genes and I will change a lot. Well, not so much, but still an obvious change to people's biology. Can you predict how these kids' behavior will be overall? You cannot predict anything unless you know their environment, nothing. You know, you can say maybe, oh, they will be a bit impaired in terms of learning. Well, it depends on the, the, the environment. That's what I want to say. In the end, it depends entirely on the environment. So whatever uh, biological tweak you do to your body, let's say you can tweak all kinds of things, it's not predictable. You cannot look at human behavior unless you look at the environment, human behavior in the environment. Of course, that environment is also your body, but again, that's all, that's all we know, what we can predict. Looking at the environment, you can predict some behaviors. Look at the, the genes, look at the, the stress level and so and so forth, looking at the, ke the chemistry, I would say, chem biochemistry. You cannot predict much at all. I think I haven't seen someone, because else we, we kind of use it maybe to predict like, okay, maybe these people have this kind of biochemical, you know, it was this kind of meat in, in mental diseases or called diseases that a like, chemical imbalance, you know, makes people whatever, which is kind of, not supported by much evidence at all, you know. But we have another Trumpcast about uh, uh, behavior, uh, like a two hours, three hours Trumpcast about behavior. Uh, maybe I'll not like to focus the entire the entirety of the mm -hmm. this, this is going to be the problem for every part of the Trump documentary. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, extending into a long conversation. <laughs> yeah, but I think we all agree that in the end, you know, our values come from the environment, like what you hate, what you like, what you dislike, you know, you know. So that's important. That's what I wanted to show with this part. Like, hey, whatever we do is come from the environment. So then let's look at this environment. That was my point there. Let's look at who we are. Right. So a big part of the Trump documentary was about the monetary system. Something that I completely agree with and I disagree so much in a sense, you know. Uh, yeah, that's that's why I maybe in a way I want to create another documentary. Uh, I said, okay, what's up with this fucking society? You know, that influences us. What our values come from? Now that we are, uh, agree that our values come from the environment, and generally, it's the monetary system. That's what it is. You know, why do we don't have that much, uh, I don't know, education or better education because of money? We either lack money or people want to make a profit and we don't care about education. Why do why do I have to spend so much time working? You know. So much time, like uh, families are clustered in a specific way. Why? But they're also influenced by this monetary system, the values that are promoted through movies, through media, to whatever the fuck sells, you know? So the, it's this fucking cluster of things that I think you can break down to like the monetary system, you know, uh, money, you know, and then then what this fucking structure is, because this has been existed for, existed for many thousands of years now, probably since the event of, of agriculture, and you, you had to like move shit from one place to another, labor and so forth. So my focus was hugely on the monetary system. I think so people who watch Trumpcast and watch our stuff may understand why I agree, but in a sense, I ah, kind of fucking disagree there, because it's monetary system just, it's not, the focus is not, uh, that complete for today's world. And we will unwrap more of this, but we did so in deep, all kinds of Trumpcast that I don't even know if I should repeat chat or not, but I will say this, how long as I have some notes. Uh, what I said in the first video of the, the monetary system is that all uh, isms 
communism and socialism and all of these isms are in fact monetary systems. So in a way I was correct that, you know, whatever we see in the world, China, USSR, Romania back in the days, whatever, even feudalism, even like they still use some sort of money, you know, from kings to slaves. They use like they sell slaves, they sell land, they put taxes on and so forth. In that sense, yeah, I, I agree. It's true. It's just that it creates this confusion that people have. They think that um because then some people criticize it, oh, but communism, communism didn't want to use money. Socialism didn't want to use money. I kind of brushed those aside. I was like, ah, shut up. You know, I come from Romania. We know very well the communism there was a big motherfucking monetary system. But if you look after I wrote the money game and beyond book, if you look at these ideas, yes, they didn't propose to use any fucking money. You know, they were maybe socialism here and there, but they, they are different from their implementation, you know? So maybe I should have mentioned that you know, that could be important, you know. The original yeah, so, idea. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yeah. the original the idea yeah. itself. People just took that and just, ah, we are communists, whatever. China may think that they're communists. Oh, fuck off. You, know, <laughs> you, you have the the big, the big most billionaires in the world China has, you know. It's, that's not communist, basically. So that's my main criticism for the in, intro, introduction of, of the video, of course. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, in 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 uh, overall, if if I were to to say about this monetary system, is that I think it's important. I what I did well there, I I, I agree with me now after so many years, is that I blame the monetary system instead of blaming people. Instead, I blame like, look, the monetary system creates this problem. The monetary system is a fault because it's the environment. You know, don't just blame people. You blame people, you put them in jail. Nothing, you solve nothing. So at least I agree with that. I, I agree. And overall, of course, I agree. You know, the monetary system fucks things up, but it's just incomplete. You know, that's why I want to make a, a new documentary to explain that monetary system is just a subsystem of, of trade. The entire society is based on trades. That's basically what we do. That's the basic thing that we all do. You know, money is just one of them. But back in 2010, you see, you ha I haven't heard of cryptocurrencies. I haven't heard on social credits. The data collection was not like a big thing. Uh, you know, the attention economy, again, not that a big thing. Today is a fucking completely different world. And and you should look in the, the next 10 years, it will change so dramatically that people will think, oh, it's money free, meaning free to just go and live in these apartments that are owned by Airbnb. Because Airbnb will be like, yeah, come here. It's free, but all of the gadgets there are probably like paid for Amazon or Google to use their own shit. So they'd make you buy them or collect your data. They will use all kinds of these ads uh, based trades, you know, like I give you an example, you should see that I, I'm sure I'll be very correct about this, but uh, self driving cars will be free, meaning money free, but you'll see ads there. And in New York, I've seen that there are some taxi, taxi companies, and I was quite surprised to, to hear that, but that uh, uh, it costs less to go in those taxi companies because in the back seat, they have big screens where they advertise for Burger King, for McDonald's, you know, so they get paid by these companies already for you to see the ads, you know? So I think it's a different world from that in 2010. It's a very important distinction to highlight, you know? That would be the overall criticism of my focus there. It's not a criticism as it is more about a better understanding now, you know, of, of this environment, right. I would say. <clears throat> and probably the taxis will have all sorts of smart gadgets that collect all the data of, you know, your conversations that you had in the back of a taxi, everything else. I, I can also see China. We had we had this discussion before about uh, social credits, but I can see, for example, China moving away from a monetary system and depending totally on social credits. One day, I wouldn't be surprised. And some people say that uh, may say that, hey, but all of these are monetary systems in the end. I think uh, maybe we we can agree in terms of semantics about that, but I think it's confusing to call them like that because they actually like cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies got popular on the backs of how bad the monetary system is. Oh, the Federal Reserve Bank and bands money out of nowhere, and they became popular just be because of that, because they 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 jumped on this hype train of like, ah, fuck the monetary, fuck money, you know, fuck money, and they invented a new cryptocurrency. So I think it's it's confusing if you still call it a mon monetary system, like all of them, like data collection and trade, uh, influencer marketing, social credits, and so forth. You know, 
Yeah, because a lot of people will be like, oh, there's no money involved. Mm -hmm. Nothing at all. It's just some credit. Yeah, it's, con it's confusing. And it's, uh, we discuss so much about this, but it's confusing to not understand that this system is based on trades. And if you only focus on money, you, you kind of forget about these things. Because look at this guy, Peter Diaman, he's just like, oh, we will create a world of abundance in the future and became very influential. Like the president of the US back then, he was like recommending his book and all shit like that. Uh, because look, we can like make phones and give phones almost like at zero cost to people because Google collect your data and put ads and so forth. How is that not the same shit? You know, different smells, same shit. It's same, you know? So you can get fooled by these people saying these things, right? Same with China. You know, they think they don't think in terms of money, but in terms of points based on behavior and so forth. But it's the same shit, you know, it's forcing, it leads to bad behaviors. It wasn't this in the recent news uh, yesterday or something like uh, they hacked. Um, <laughs> and I, in a way, I'm uh, happy to hear that. They hacked Jeff Bezos' Twitter account. <laughs> and uh, what they post there is like, hey, guys, I'm into Bitcoin now. And uh, whoever I donates to my Bitcoin. Guys. Yeah. yeah, whoever donates to my Bitcoin address, I will double that amount or something like that. They give you back. And they made 170000 or something dollars based on this shit. See Bitcoin. Use Bitcoin. You can use anything. Maybe social credits in the future, who knows, to improve your social credits or whatever. But yeah, that's important to make that distinction there. And my entire documentary, entire documentary the, the next one will be kind of revolving around this trade-based system to explain it in detail, what it is. You know the next term term documenting yeah and i think data is also very important you know to to think about because data is like gold now you know this is mm -hmm. a highly wanted uh, resource basically and if you don't pay attention to this data trading as a trade you know and just concentrate on money monetary whatever money then you're missing out a, a big chunk a big problem this company yeah. even thing, even if in the end like even if in that. the end they say that uh, or they transform that into money somehow yeah but there are other cases where they won't transform it into money they'll transform it into something else of influence for example or becoming even bigger and more powerful in this world and taking other decisions behind your back and you have some news about that you'll see at the end of this discussion and also i think it's important to that people realize how much more invasive that is too just to have your privacy invaded and just just for the mere, you know, uh, purpose of keeping the system of trade going. Just, you know, we're, we're doing it for something that's so non-existent and unimportant in reality. But, you know, what, what they're actually doing is so invasive. And, and then not only that, again, it's shaping the way you think, too. Like that article Aaron wrote, all that stuff that they cycle back you know based off of what you're looking at then they show you more of it and it's just a, a vicious cycle yeah yeah just to sell you more and more shit so yeah if people don't realize trade how how big that is and they're only looking at money they're missing a huge part of what is fucking up our society you know it's confusing you know if you look only at money because that, that's what I did. And then I, I tried to cluster them, the cryptocurrencies too. Actually, when I was at TVP, I was working with TVP, I started to write about these things because I was talking to Roxanne and others. And like, look, people get confused. I, I'm getting many emails from TV Magazine. Like, People think that we need to invent another cryptocurrencies or something, another system of points and so forth. And I was like, okay, that's bad. They, if they really think that that's how you get rid of this fucked up environment to create, to replace Burger King with McDonald's, then it's bad. So I started to write about these things. That's how I changed basically the way that I think about it. And then I, I remember when I read that book, The Money Game and Beyond, I said, okay, I will stop talking about money. From now on, I'll stop. No more. I won't even pronounce the word fucking money. Trade. And I'll explain what trade is. I think it's, it serves me quite well in understanding better this world and maybe to, for others to understand. So. Um, yeah. And in, when I was talking about this monetary system, I wanted to do throw in some interesting subjects and how we are influenced, how the monetary system drives this, some notions, you know, and influences us through all kinds of notions. So like, for example, one was the documents. How are you part of this monetary system? Well, apparently it's just some fucking papers, you know, uh, why don't we regard them as such? Just 
have no value. You know, when fucking these people, the motherfuckers, make me sign all kind of shit sometimes. I'm like, what the fuck is that? Uh, at first, I saw signing with no. I just put there, no. You know, mm. uh, one point, <laughs> yeah. Now I, I'm signing with like AO. It's like I saw this movie about these Neanderthals back in the days, and uh, one of the Neanderthals was called Ao. And I think it's funny. It's like, Ao. Oh. Oh, I sign like the Neanderthal. Oh, mm -hmm. you know, when I made my passport, I forgot how the fuck I was signing, and I was like, "What the fuck?" Because the guy wanted to check, you know, if it's my signature. I was oh, like, "I fucking yeah. forgot." And he was very like, "What?" You know, and he maybe signed like ten times. And he's like, "Well, this looks like a cockroach, like a fucking bug." He said to me, "I'm like, it could be, my friend. I don't fucking know, you know, I don't know." So they put so much importance in these bullshit things. It annoys me, you know. It's uh, fucking papers, you know. It's just papers, just pa imagination papers. So it's important to know that that's how you participate in the system. Imagination, that's all, you know. <laughs> and I guess it to forage, actually. It's uh, it's easy for if people want to take advantage of any society, they just can impersonate you. And uh, that's not even a difficult thing to do, actually. And I so showcase that in the documentary. It was this guy, uh, it was an interesting story. They made even a movie about this, because of course they make movies about such things that are interesting to sell more shit. But this guy who, it was the movie, something like Catch Me If You Can. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, it was this guy who's like forging all kinds of papers and he becomes like a pilot and then he becomes like whatever the fuck, travels around the world, you know, impersonating being this guy or that guy. is like, what the fuck, it really works. You know, mm -hmm. so in, in the end they catch him and then they hire him to like catch other bad people basically. But yeah, is it working? <laughs> I come from an environment where people steal credit card information and scam people. You know, it's quite easy. You know, I remember even now in college, I went to this guy's house because he wanted to to do a business with me. I was in college, I was poor as fuck, and I was considering it a little bit, but I didn't do anything. Don't worry, folks. I will not admit it anyways. But um, <laughs> I went to this guy's house. And the guy's showing me his email uh, inbox. And he gets like tens, tens of emails every day with credit cards, new credit cards from people because they have all kinds of spyware around the world. He's like, okay, if you want some credit cards I have here, for they don't even know what's on, on those credit cards. And they can use them and steal your bullshit imaginary money, right? Or your identity. You know, that's also something that they did. They go on this, um, let's say, a website where they sell cars, right? And uh, on this website, they say, we rely on reputation. If you have a good reputation and you have more clients to sell your secondhand cars, right? They go there, they steal your account. So basically they steal your reputation and they put some, oh, very expensive car, cars at a very low price. And people want to buy them and they say, okay, but you have to send me some money in advance, right? They impersonate you, they steal your account. So they send you some money, you know, because you trust them. You just trust papers and names in this society and you got scammed. And basically that's how it is in today's society. You know, we rely on fake some people ask me sometimes, oh, is your name Theo? I'm like, yeah, it is. But, but is it in your passport? I'm like, well, it's not like that. But it, what's the fucking difference? But what is your name then? Oh, it's still fucking Theo, you know? Not fucking Theo, but just Theo. <laughs> and just don't get it. Like, what is so relevant? Like, bullshit things. So what do you guys think about papers? Do you like papers? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think that's just a waste of life. Like, think of how much time you spend filling out forms and having to do all these like jumping jumping through hoops just to get from point a to point b it's like you're uh, such a distraction yeah. and stress yeah it's the biggest bullshit in this society you know you're just so trapped either in one tribe or another based on the papers you were born with the papers you managed to get all the bullshit you have to go through just to what just to exist in one tribe in this society and then if you if you lose yeah uh i had a, a cousin who he had his wallet stolen that had all of his ids like he, he basically was like a, a joe blow kind of thing um and it's almost it's it's very difficult to get anything back when you have nothing um which is just like a, a mind like what is a person supposed to do in that situation mm -hmm. like oh i guess you just don't exist anymore like but, yeah. <laughs> you know, because we discussed about this in one Trumpcast, like this guy in Romania, I think it was a case where he was wrongly uh, declared as dead. And then the guy had no idea. And then he went to well, no, take a credit or something. It's like, I'm sorry, sir, but you are dead. You know, I'm not fucking dead. Well, 
the documents show here that you died like two years yeah, ago. Yeah, all right. What the fuck do you <laughs> deny reality here? <laughs> yeah. Or like one time when I tried to buy a car, um, I don't know, like five or six years ago, they pulled my credit report and then they, they showed it to me and I had all these things on there. It was like, I, I don't know, I defaulted on a, a school loan like when I was seven or something. And I was like, there's no way for me because... <laughs> I, I wasn't old enough to be in college then. And they were like, well, it says it's you. And I was like, it must be another person. Finally, they figured out it was another Jennifer Foster that they'd merged our credit reports. But I was like, uh, okay, <laughs> oh, cool. shit. So they merged it? It wasn't just the wrong person? Like, but the paper, the paper says. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. The paper says. Oh, well. Wow. Uh, maybe one thing that I disagree a bit <laughs> in this part of the documentary. Is I put this uh, video with Jack, who says that um, maybe in the future he he's like saying we should use different names, like um, different tags to understand better, like where this person comes from, like G67 or whatever. He gives some examples, and maybe tagging people better will tell you more about them, which I don't see today as being that relevant or working in anyways like i don't think that's i present that as an alternative solution that's one thing that i did to the entire monetary system part i presented alternative solutions i didn't say those are solutions I said, uh, alternative solution some of them right so maybe that's something i don't see how you naming people today i don't see after uh, so many years of more more than 10 years of living since then i don't see how that can be useful do you guys see like Maybe naming people differently will give you more information about them, especially in this day and age where you have social accounts or online accounts. And yeah, your information, I mean, the, your personality changes. Yeah. What you know about the world changes. So I think he said more about, um, he said more about like professions or yeah, something. Yeah, right. Like if you're a scientist you're... in this area, you get like a letter designated or something. I, don't, and... I think that. I think that's also problematic because that's again going into this like identification issue where it's like I'm not just a human being on this planet. I'm a teacher or I'm a dancer or I'm a scientist or I'm this, you know. And if you make it a part of your name, then you really ingrain that. Mm. So it's like you are your profession, you are your career, which I think is a bad mm. thing because I'm not anything. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I'm yeah. Just a fucking human. Yeah, also labeling people, I think it's, uh, you know, it's nothing is that good to, to say, oh, he's a scientist based on his name, or I don't like the social certifications. I don't think they do well yeah. in the society but of a role. Didn't, uh, like, is, this is not how last names began, you know, that, like, you know, the last name kind of it represents who you worked at as, like, Smith was... Oh, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Or, these kind of things. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I've read something like this. Change. So, wh where is the yeah. f family name of Dick comes from then? <laughs> <laughs> where did that guy work at? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't see it mm -hmm. any different as the labels we use now. It's just a different flavor. I mean, it's the same thing. Yeah, and I mean, of course, every human is a lot more complex than just like a few words that they would choose to represent themselves with. Right. So. Yeah, I mean, look at all the labels people put on themselves. Now I have to Google what that means. <laughs> 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 what was that word, flexitarian? Are you a flexitarian? <laughs> I've read this with, with Sasha in this TZM quiz. He was like, they want to know more about the people who follow TZM. I should have asked. Uh, what was Brandon? his name? Brandon last time, but I was like, What are you? V vegan, flexitarian? Isn't I'm like, I, I feel like a flexitarian, I don't know what it is, but I feel like flexible <laughs> enough, you know. Yeah, <laughs> Apparently, it's something it. like with like eat meat but not or something like that. Some time to time, I don't, I think these labels are just like, ah, they just it make me puke sometimes, yeah, well, like, like a yeah, group identity kind of thing, yeah, you separate that. Yeah, from other yeah I, I'm one of these uh, things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah, rather than just being a human, you know, and regardless of what I eat, what I like to fuck, what I like to, you know, do in the daytime, I'm just a human, you know. Mm -hmm. Call me whatever right. name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't, I see don't Noel... divide me into groups. I don't think that yeah, yeah. helps. Yeah. I see, I see Noel asks so many questions on Trump chat. Yeah, right. Noel, <laughs> calm down. I, I don't think we yeah. can. 
answer all of these questions. <laughs> but he <laughs> asked some interesting ones, maybe. Because uh, he said that some people say that money uh, are a way to measure resources. If there will be no feedback to know what resources we have, then we will be quite, uh, you we kind of need this money thing to manage resources. What do you guys think about it? It's an old fashioned, we did at one point, but we have techno like way more advanced technology to do that. I, mean, I don't think they actually what, ever, yeah. I don't think they really measure, you know, the, the amount of resources, what do you mean? Like what resources we have on the planet? I don't think money is, a, if, if it is a measurement, I don't think it's a very good one because you can take like a Picasso <laughs> painting that's worth like millions of dollars and that's worth a lot more than a shelter or food. You know, and so it's, it's very distorted. We have a very distorted value of our resources. If if money is meant to, you know, put a value on those things, it's you not can a measure good them in so it. many ways. Without money, and you only put prices there to sell them from one part to another. If you want to measure them, what stops you to measure them in all kinds of ways, like the energy output that or input that you need to extract this uh, material or you can measure them in all kinds of ways. You don't need to put money on them. You know how many units you have. You know how many tons you have. Use the fucking imperial system. You know or something of measurement. The um, technocracy had this idea. I think I told you to um, use some energy units, which is much more relevant than fucking money. Of course, like how much energy goes into making a fork or making a house, right? In from all of the process, extracting materials, building the house and so forth. You know, so look, that's one example, but I don't think you really need these things. What is he asking? He said that Elon Musk is naming his child A12 Musk. Okay. <laughs> no, you forgot, you forgot the, uh, it's like X, A, E, A12 Musk. It's all uh, uh, a thing going on here. Yeah, it's... I'm sure he will be a very interesting kid. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Probably give himself a nickname. <laughs> yeah. Alex. <laughs> yeah, just call me Alex. <laughs> Please. Um, yeah, next thing, the educational system, which is just uh, like, briefly, it's kind of bullshit. <laughs> I mean, it is because it's like... Uh, I don't know, as it, as it's from my experience, I presented my experience the, more, the educational system. And then in this past 10 years or so, after talking to many people from all around the world, it seems that it wasn't that different. It's not like Romania was such a shit show after all, you know, it, the educational system is a shit show everywhere. Worldwide shit it, show. It seems. Worldwide shit show. So yeah, it's, they teach you quite useless things that you can't even remember. Uh, that's, the, that's the idea there, basically. I also said again that they ta taught me a, a language that is old and interpretable. What I will argue, and I argued a lot in the term book on language support, all languages are interpretable, really, but we will get to that part. Don't worry. I'll come. So that's about the educational system. I see it's that is quite of a, yeah. Yeah, I would just say that, you know, it's it's kind of there to prepare you for a career. Yeah. To, yeah. To be a slave in this system. Yeah, currently. And I give some examples of how you could do it, like uh, different kinds of school systems where Kids can come to those schools whenever they want, do whatever they want. Teachers are there just to teach them some stuff. Like you want to take lessons or you want to learn about history, you come to me and I'll teach you. you now, especially now with the online world, you can very easily provide any kind of education to anyone, personalized education, you know. <clears throat> so yeah. Um, and I think we discussed about education in other podcasts, so. But, um, Let's talk about work, because we also talked in another Trump cast about work, but uh, it's something that I don't agree that much with. Oh yeah, Alex, if you want to say something, sure. Oh yeah, if I may, regarding the, the education. So I mm -hmm. think like one one thing that you sort of touched in the documentary, um, uh, but but maybe, maybe not enough is like, well, currently uh, there is a science like behaviorism science of you know of, of behavior of people. Okay, what what affects the behavior, what uh, uh, reinforces behavior, and stuff like that. And schools are sort of doing that all the time, right? They like uh, they compliment people for doing good work, or they punish people for doing not so good work and stuff like that. Uh, but it's not in the scientific manner. 
Okay, like teachers are not behaviorists. Okay, teachers do not go, uh, do not understand all of um, the ways how environment or anything changes behavior. So, if it, even if their goals were correct, which you know, education since the goals are are really messed up, you know, because they sort of uh, the goals are uh, uh, getting people into the workforce and you know and doing uh getting into the monetary system doing trade all the time and stuff like that so even if their goals were correct their methodology there doesn't implement actual scientific methods most of the time okay teachers are sort of taught on a very superficial level uh how to teach people or how to affect their knowledge or behavior but uh it has very little scientific base and that's why eventually i think the educational system, you know, you bring people in, you add some garbage, and you have garbage out, okay? Uh, and that's that's sort of a problem. And, and no, and an educational system is required, right? In the future, if the future would be really better, you know, and uh, things would actually change, then there will still be an educational system, but the goals of the educational system and the methods would have to be very different. Uh, but that was sort of such as or the solutions and not the problems which the documentary focuses Yeah, and I would say that um, I don't think we lack uh, so-called smart people who know how to properly educate human beings. There are, I showcase in the documentary, there are a bunch of people who n understand more about human behavior and they will know how to do it. But the problem is that in trade-based society, the teachers don't go there to teach children. They go there to also make money or to just make money. So for them, it doesn't matter really, or the school system itself, they don't, they don't quite have a goal other than just keeping kids there and just promoting sometimes it's nationalistic you know promoting our own peace story and other whatever bullshit we have there so if we people didn't rely on that and we we don't lack people who will know how to properly educate kids or methods there are all kinds of examples out there but we it's hard to do it in this society because you need the incentive there is no incentive there because people want to get something out of it you know so I remember in school, people, so many, I, I had this kind of teachers who, it was this one teacher, it was such a funny fucking thing. It was a physics teacher. He will come to our classes, say nothing, stay on the desk and put his hands like this and she, he was looking at us for one hour. That's all he did. We were like, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? But probably the guy was like completely like, fuck off you people, like you kids. I just want to take my payment and go fuck home. You know, I knew, we knew that he had some problems, his financial problems and so forth. He was completely like, I don't care. But if teachers will care and will also be focused, like Alex was saying, to, to understand human behavior, and there are a bunch who understand that and know how to do it, then it will be a completely different educational system. You know, it will be quite constant. You know, not only just from age this to age that. It will be a constant. Consistent. Education. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can move to work work now. Because uh, work is an integral part, of course, of our uh, life in this society. And uh, maybe one thing that I said there that I don't fully, I, I, I'm not sure if I should fully trust, is that there was this study showing that, um, you know, people do better, better if they have uh, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. I'm like, it sounds good. I, I've read later on the studies and so forth. I've read others who said that maybe the studies were not that relevant. I will just present that as a, like, okay, food for thought, but I'm not, I don't know if I can say it in a scientific way. Yes, people are uh, uh, very motivated by autonomy and mastery and purpose when it comes to creative work. But anyways, it's just like, I, do, I will not put that air anymore. I will just explain that people like, are forced to work in this society if I'll do it again. You know, they are enslaved basically most of the time because you have little choices to make it in this system unless you work, fucking work, you know. And yeah, I think that there there are tons of. Uh, okay, sorry, Sashi, you were saying something. No, no, it's okay. Go, go ahead. I, I, uh, well, I I've uh, I've read uh, quite a few experiments or, or research on animals when you restrict their autonomy. Okay, like if you put them in a small box and you restrict their physical movement stuff like that, uh, they they get like uh, depressed sort of. Okay. Uh, so they they are they're less active, you know. They they go into a state uh, which is which eventually severely affects their health. Okay, if if you do it for, for too long of a time, so I, I think there's something to that to to that autonomy. Uh, okay, people sort of 
strive to sort of some sort of autonomy because it gives them control over the outcome you know of of, uh, of what's happening okay and then they can affect it in their in their favor okay if it's people animals most animals you know uh, maybe apes but most animals are not probably thinking about you know the future and try to simulate that but there's uh there's some negative effects to restricting autonomy of both animals and probably humans as well yeah, yeah probably it is. is but I think yeah. also I mean, putting someone in like a small box is a lot more than restricting <laughs> the autonomy. I mean, it's like putting them in like maximum security prison or you know just a cage. It's of course they're going to have problems. Yeah, you know, I, I agree. I agree with this. The the kind the conclusions. I would say oh, I would agree, but I just it because it's presented in a like very scientific way. And I also put it in a very scientific way there. Like okay, those are the what motivates people to work not what we do now and i will be like i don't know i'm just a bit uncomfortable about that not saying more than it's just a bit uncomfortable about that because <laughs> i don't know what motivates people there are so many things that that motivates people to, to to work with it i made a book about cooperation and competition there are also people who are very motivated and being competitive depends on what you want to achieve it's such a mix of things you know you know with different outcomes anyways but overall, there are lots of you know positive things that can motivate people to do positive work, you know, and not yeah. just be slaves and some. Oh, yeah, so absolutely. That that's not necessary that they don't like to do. And, yeah. and what is the solution to enslaving people? Automate the fucking work. You know what the fuck is wrong with you? You know you leave that like young girl saying there, staying there in the like beep beep with products and beep all day fucking long, and it's like all our good day morning whatever what the fuck is that you know it's awful <laughs> yeah we can skip some maybe i don't know maybe the profit and if it's much to say about it is i agree you know whenever people put the profit first uh, is they are going to maybe lie and cheat and and so forth it's something quite obvious in today's world you know and it's like this basic example that if i make something whatever i make I give to the world like uh, I trade for like I make phones. For example. I cannot tell tell you if if the other company makes better phones to go there and buy that because I'll be out of business, you know. So it's quite an easy thing to understand that you want to make a profit, you will do it at any cost. You know, rarely some people will be honest in such situations. Rarely, I would say. <laughs> um, yeah, let me go through. I go a bit through like. Uh, politicians you know uh, what the fuck are politicians you know and uh, are they capable of taking decisions so far and i know it was this came from from jack a lot saying that um yeah politicians have no technical ca capacity to solve any problems and so forth which i agree of course is it's stupid that you have like a, a president that's, that's a lawyer or some shit or some tv personality uh, but in the end we shouldn't have that in the first place like you shouldn't have uh, a fucking leader deciding regardless how much you know in the soviet union it was a emphasis on uh, scientists actually and um, engineers and they're like very into the like yeah let's take decisions uh, properly and then even in romania they, they did a lot of bullshit based on scientists meaning depending on what, what your uh, motivation is you can doesn't matter if it's a scientist or not you will do sh bullshit things so they said in romania oh we kind of realized in, when in the communist romania that people don't need that much food so we calculated in a scientific way how much food people need. So now we are rationing food. You are not allowed to buy more than this amount of food per week or per month. And that was quite bad. Like people wanted like famine. It was, you can't take decisions like that, you know? Decisions should be more dynamic, not like top down. You know, I don't like this kind of thinking of, oh, having uh, people with knowledge in, in power unless we understand you know what what is it that creates bad things in our behavior in our environment you know you cannot put just scientists put now neil deGrasse Tyson. Ah, that's not even a scientist he's like fucking pop scientist <laughs> dude <laughs> but put, put some like a bunch of scientists in and you will see corruption and you will see them doing all kinds of bad decisions on the back of science and so forth so it's more about we shouldn't have this kind of system in the fucking first place you know a few people taking decisions of course, voting democracy, it's always like, what the fuck is democracy, you know? Probably Philippines is a democracy. I just saw a documentary recently about this Duterte guy in, in Philippines. Quite a great democracy there. The guy is killing lots of people. I think it's great. 
It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, these ideas are quite bullshit, you know. But it, and uh, I think I put there the, this video of Car uh, Josh Carlin. He says something like, uh, it is the American dream because you have to be asleep to believe it, you know. It was quite a nicely put, you know. It is called the American dream, yeah, because it, you have to be asleep to believe it, you know. Oh, the democracy, oh, the politicians, oh, this fight, nonsense fight, you know. Yeah, my Politi sister and I were talking about, like, the, we always get these two choices, and they're all always, like, the worst, worst people. And my sister's like, yeah, I was just told to pick the lesser of the two evils, and we we're like, I mean, what kind of world is this? Yeah, the douche <laughs> world is this that, yeah, right. <laughs> like, like the two people we're picking from are are like both been accused of such awful thing. You know, it's just like, oh, but this one's a little bit better. I heard I heard Kanye West was running for president. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you better believe it. You, you better believe it, Sasha. You'd think he's not going to be the next president of the United States. I'll vote just for that, you know, like. Right, yeah. Yeah, this rate can yeah. it get it worse. Like, look, look at what's going on right now. It just, every day is, is like. I was probably not a difference to Trump, but yeah, whatever. Yeah, it's all, right. of course, yeah. it's all the same regardless. <laughs> I mean, Donald Trump is. Is just so, just so awful. Mm -hmm. he's, he's actually a great example of, of, you know, the environment of what it can do to a person. Just It's the fantastic environment, Jen, the best environment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that, that's why I have, you know, this argument against democracy as well, even, I mean, first of all, of course, like, you, you only get these bullshit choices. And in the end, what are they going to change? Not much, right? But even just out of those two bullshit choices, people are so manipulated by the media, especially by social networks now. I mean, if you look in the Philippines, this guy, this douchebag looking president, Duterte, who's like killing thousands of people on this like war on drugs, he's like, a lot of people support him and they support him because there's like pop stars and stuff support him mm. on social networks. And people are just like, they, you know, they have these bullshit, stupid rallies that are just a bunch of nothingness and people are so easily manipulated into just like, Oh yeah, this guy is great. And in the end, they're all just, you know, yeah, not great at all. <laughs> yeah. That's what I was telling my sister. I was like, even, even if there's like the lesser of the two evils that becomes popular, I feel like the president is already picked regardless. Like even if like they have all these uh, loopholes and rules, I don't even know. I don't, cause I don't waste any time trying to learn this because to me it's just all irrelevant. But when it comes to voting, they're like, Oh, well they have like the electoral college and this, even though they got more votes, this still makes them the winner. And right, I'm like, yeah. it doesn't make any sense. None of it make, and that just tells me that it, they're already chosen to begin with. You know, there is no democracy. <laughs> well, look at Russia. It's like it, <laughs> President Putin has been in power for like yes. 20 years. And I mean, president. people vote. But, you know, there was like a guy who was, uh, you know, wanting to run for president who wanted to oppose him, who maybe could have actually had a chance. And what they did was they a little while ago, they arrested him. And then they said, you can't run for president because you've been arrested. And people that have been arrested can't run for president. <laughs> Look at you that. Know, and they absolutely have no choices anyway. And, and even if he loses, like, he'll be president anyway. And he'll just be like, I'm president. No. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a huge shit show now, especially with yeah. the so-called social media. Because they invest so much in manipulating people directly based on their interests and so forth. It's quite easy. It's, it's, they separate them, you know, and they target them. Yeah. Like if uh, this Trump motherfucker invested like 80 million or something in Facebook when he went for presidency, who the fucking compete with that? You know, so. <laughs> well, I think that's yes. one good point that uh, Jacques Fresco made was like, if we had a real democracy, we would have like hundreds of choices to choose from. Why do we only mm -hmm. have two, two people? That's, yeah. where's the choice? Yeah, and even when they're president, like, can you choose, like, okay, can we not invest any more money into the military? Can we put all of that money into education, into providing people with food and health care? Can we, you know? Can we well, I would think that if anything, this year alone would just 
especially in America, would just wake people up because like so many people are outraged right now because they don't feel safe putting their kids in school when we're having this huge outbreak and the president's like they're we're going they're going to school <laughs> and and in fact i read a thing like a politician said well if we don't have kids go to school we're going to have a large population of kids that aren't going to get fed and that are going to be left at home where they're going to be subjected to uh domestic violence and i was like that is your whole that's supposed to be a good thing like that is supposed to be why we're supposed to want to like what kind of fucked up world is this you know like i i just don't understand to me it's just so insane yeah but do you think people will vote about that to send kids oh. to school now yeah i guess that i kind of missed my point there the point was that people don't want to put their kids in school obviously because we have this huge outbreak going on and and it just shows that we have no democracy like you can see mm -hmm. that the majority of people don't want this to happen and it's going to happen regardless of what we want you know top down mm -hmm. yeah okay and uh, we are going to the subject that i love very much it's called language <laughs> Right. And this is, I wanted to remove that from Tom documentary. I was so outraged with me that I wanted to just remove that part. <laughs> and, you know, but I was like, I'll just leave it there for fuck's sakes. Because the premise of that is that, um, you know, we, we are taught a language that is old and subject to interpretation. And in a way, the alternative for that would be like a better language. If we invent a better language, maybe the communication will improve and so forth. And I took that for granted until I started to write a book about language. And I went through a lot of like online lectures from, from top professors that studied li language, linguistics and so forth and experiments and all of that. <laughs> I wrote like a 600 pages book on language. I, we made the Tromcast about it. And basically the summary here is that that's not correct. Like every language is subject to interpretation. Even, even science is subject to interpretation. If you don't have the context, it's difficult to explain now. If, if I start to talk about this, it will take us three hours, you know, mm -hmm. but Basically, all language is based on, you cannot say, oh, E, e equals MC squared. Uh, everybody agrees on that. It depends on the context. You know, what are those things standing for? And the fact that we, to resume it, uh, summarize it in a nutshell, the reason the scientists get better along with each other or mathem mathematicians and physicists and so forth is because they share the common understanding. That's one thing. They share, they understand the world better than common, normal people. And second, they discuss about a world that is, much easier to define, you know, you can test it. You can test how the speed of light is, like how, like how fast that is. You can test it from planets to human anatomy and so forth. It's less subject for interpretation there, not because of the language, but because of the context, the knowledge, knowledge that they know, and the fact that they try to describe a world that we can describe in a way or another. For us here, you know, even if we use the same words, like, oh, theory, we use words like heart and liver. You know, every doctor I've been to, they use the same fucking words but they understand much better what they mean by that, you know? Uh, the fact that we use this kind of words, say like, hey, how are you? You know, how's your day been and stuff like that. Uh, we try to describe a world that is so like muddy. It's so transparent, so opaque, it's so nothing here. It's, you cannot, you can, it was this idea of like, oh, people say the sunrise or sunset, you know, how ridiculous is that? And I was like, yeah, hey, that's kind of ridiculous. The sun doesn't rise on sets, but then I'm like, Everything is ridiculous. I give so many examples in the book. Every fucking thing is ridiculous. You don't just get into a car. You know, there's, the process is more complex than that. You don't just drive a car, you know. Or you don't just ride a horse and ride a bike. If you try to ride a horse like you ride a bike, you will be getting problem to problems, you know. <laughs> you know, so in that, that's the input here. It's I, I say the entire uh, premise of this language part of the documentary, I will argue against it. And it's good for me to like, evolve and think differently now. I'm happy that I wrote that book because I learned so much. And I don't think the solution here is to improve language. I don't think you can do much about that anyways. And I've gone to so many languages in this world is maybe to make it easier to understand and so forth. But if you want to improve communication, you have to improve the context. If people are educated about climate change, it doesn't matter if you speak Chinese or one of the dialects in China or English, US or fucking Irish, which is not fucking English. You know, stop with that nonsense. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
no, it's in, it's English. But uh, if it doesn't matter what you speak, if you understand what climate change is, you can talk to other people about that with whatever language you want to use. You can even use drawings and you understand each other. That's my input. And if you guys want to, have to do it, say anything, I'm here to talk about it. Yes, Alex. Yes, Alex, you want to say something? Oh, sorry, I was muted. Uh, yeah, that's that what, what uh, got me a little bit confused when you use the word context and with my background is doing it differently, you know, what, you, what context is sort of, uh, uh, well, I think what, what you relate to as context, you know, our background, right? A background of a person and all of their knowledge and all the culture, you know, right? So uh, if we have sort of similar context, obviously we can't have this exactly the same one, but if we have a very similar context, then they make it easier for us to communicate. But uh, eventually when we want to transfer information, right, our brains aren't wired together, uh, right? So we want to transfer information, we use stuff like whether drawing or speaking, right? We we'll use some kind of language. Uh, and then when we do that, if the language has uh, is not optimal for communication, then we might have errors of conveying that information. Though even if they have the same background, uh, we might not be able to convey the information correctly. And by that, I mean, for example, uh, like if, if we use only a language that has 10 words, okay? So, right, we might have very, very similar background, but it would be very difficult for me to convey complex ideas to you if we only use those 10 words. So we need to find a language that richer, that has more words. Or you know, or maybe a language that's more well defined. So, for example, English has a lot of different words that sound the same, or even written the same, but have different meaning. So, when I say a word to you, you might understand it in a different way because I did you know these are this is the, how the language is. Uh, or maybe there 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 some language or a language doesn't have some words, okay, or doesn't have a word to describe some phenomena. So, I have to use a lot of different other words to describe one thing. So. A language can be a limiting factor in communication, so that's, I think that the context is very, very important. If we don't have the same culture, if we don't have similar culture and we don't have similar background, then it will be probably impossible to communicate, but when we do have the same or similar uh, context or background, we might still have difficulty communicating if the language is not, uh, uh, is not good, okay, not optimal in that sense. When I looked at uh, for the book, I looked at uh, different languages. So, for example, there are languages with only ten or eleven letters. That that's more important than words because we, we form words with letters. Uh, mm -hmm. Others who have over thirty. What I looked in uh, studies is that there is not much difference in terms of like what these cultures create. You know, even though you have three times more letters, uh, most of the uh, English words are not used. I think I don't know now, but vast majority are not used anyways. You know. And you can create a lot more in English, in, in the English uh, uh, vocabulary, a lot more words, but you don't create, you know. So that doesn't seem to be, unless you go to extreme and you say, oh, just 10 words, which is quite extreme if you have 10 words, you can, of course, impair, make it, make communication more difficult. But in essence, you know, if you look at today's society, they, they don't seem to see, to find many differences. Another thing is that um, there are many kinds of communication, like it was one for blind and, uh, uh blind and deaf people they they, they f make signals signals in their palm and they don't have that many uh what you may call those as signs not even words uh they still can communicate extremely fast and extremely about so kinds so many things they can create poetry probably and they create all kinds of like also the braille uh there are many many different exam i give in the book so many examples and that's what convinced me that you know ex unless you go to extremes like you said like 10 words it's not going to make much of a difference. Or the words that are similar in, in English or are pronounced similarly, they don't quite make it. In, in Chinese, it's a, a bunch of them that are pronounced so similarly. They don't seem to make much of a difference because like, you look at different languages in the world and I know I haven't found anything, you know, and from, I, I, I've heard this from linguists who study those languages. And they say that we don't find uh, the culture to be more, more smarter or different or behaving it in one way or another, you know, China is made of at least three or four very different dialects, but it has the same culture and some very different from each other, extremely different from each other, the dialects, meaning languages. So overall, I don't see how, yes, you can improve communication maybe in terms of um, 
like presenting more information, the better structure, maybe a video is better than a book for some, you know, and stuff like that. And also I want to make it clear that when I see context, I think in the book I divided them into like the, the physical context and the cultural context. The physical context is like, if I'm blind, if to, to try to explain color to me, it's going to be very difficult, you know, to understand this because we don't share the same physical context. That's the physical context that I'm referring to. Like physicists have a better physical, a context, not only like their bodies, but the, what they study. They, you study a fucking, you want to build a fucking building. We know what we are dealing with, the materials and so forth. And the other one is cultural, you know, how you've been influenced by, by your culture to regard whatever black people or Chinese or whatever. So these two things come into existence, but it's it's difficult to explain context without a context. So that book, it's a context in, in a mm, way. I'm trying mm, to explain mm. that. It's such a trying to chew your own teeth, basically. It's, uh, it's difficult. You know, it's kind of impossible. It's backwards. I don't know how to describe it, but I think it's a lot of information in that book. Yeah. Uh, well, I I uh, I don't think that uh, letters and words have uh, I know the same effect on on the language. Okay, you can if you have less word, less letters, you can you would just have words that have more letters because you would need you know you have very few letters, so you would make longer words or whatever. But if you have less words or if you don't have enough words to describe what you want to transfer that information, then you sort of uh, you, you're stuck and then you need to spend a lot of time on every idea that you need to expand because you don't have the appropriate words to describe this specifically. So you need to use a lot lot of words to describe something that's simple. Okay, like for example, you, you can look at you know uh, uh, what humans were able to build, Okay, you said like, uh, w w w for example, what uh, cultures can create. So what cultures could create when they have very little uh, 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 words, okay, or concepts or ideas that they can they can assign words to. So they could, could create very little. And in order to create the complex stuff that our society creates today, we had uh, to make the language richer. Okay, we had to develop. We had to invent a lot of words. For example, in the sci in science, you have tons of words. Uh, that were invented just to support, you know, all the discoveries and all the things that we developed and they are being invented uh, all the time. Okay, so we had to do that in, in order to make our communication more efficient. Okay, so for example, instead of saying uh, like uh, homo sapient, okay, if we didn't have the word homo sapien, I would have to tell you, well, it what human is the, the breed or the, the whatever, what humans are and which is different from Neanderthals or whatever. So I'd have to use a lot of words to describe some, some idea and it would make our communication very inefficient. We'd have to sit here a whole day just to convey idea that might be much more simpler if we have the right word for it. So that, that doesn't say that context is not maybe number one, okay? But I'm saying that, well, like you said, context is all that matters. I, I, it's, I find I, it's very hard for me to agree that it's all that matters and that everything else is, is whatever. What, it doesn't matter which language we use, okay? Uh, what I explain in the, in the book also, there are two things here. One is that um, we use very few words and I uh, actually looked at all of the books that I wrote and I don't use more than a thousand words. And that's as such like 0.1% of something of the entire English language. So I use almost none compared to that. So I, I analyze all of my books, you know, so I give you that in an example in, in the book. So I use very, very few, few words. Second, it's true there are many invented words, especially Latin, because that's what they use. They want to use a common language for science to when they discover a new species, for example. The thing is that even there, they're kind of quite arbitrary. They use the same words. They put like the, the dragon reptile or something, or they put the mm -hmm. same two words that already existed and they just put them together. Inter and net, you know, they just, C c took one part of one word and then the net, you know, uh, many words are like that actually, are are just regurgitated uh, uh, words basically, you know. So I don't, I'm not convinced that uh, the language will improve if we have more words. And if we talk about, if you don't go to extremes, like I said, if you don't go to extremes, it says 10 words, you know, that's why in the book I gave real, real examples in today's world, the simplest language in the world and the most complex language in the world. And linguists look at these things and they didn't see much difference in their culture, in their understanding of the world, in their vocabulary and so forth. They just didn't see that. That's the science that I presented there. You know, Chinese, yeah, can, if you look I, at Chinese, it's also like, uh, they use science. Take, 
sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can take the example of you know of uh, of of your book. The fact that you well, the fact that you use only one thousand words because that's what the the, the language had. Okay, uh, may be very much affected. Uh, you know how easy it is for people to understand the ideas. Okay, or to perceive this. For example, like you, if we go, you know, to trade free. Okay, trade free is a concept, right? So there was no word in the English language, you know, to describe that concept. So you have to combine existing words like trade and free, which have you know, different meanings, put them together, and uh, we all hope that people would understand what you mean. But uh, but you know, most people won't understand what you mean because they say, "Oh, okay, right, okay, well, let's, let's get rid of money. That's trade free." You can say, "No, no, 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 wait, wait." So trade is like that. So and trade free. So you have to make a lot of effort into explaining what trade free just because there's no word for it in the English language. Okay, so the English language is limited in a sense because it doesn't have a short way, a shortcut of this, explaining this idea. And you have to, you saw the invented word, which may be more confusing. Maybe if you use the word uh, finuxio, okay, no one knows what it is. So they say they cannot not understand you. They would have to go into a dictionary or go online and look for the meaning of the word finuxio and they'll see, oh, okay, that's, that's the idea of trade free. Now they understand. But when you use existing words and you mix them together, you create errors in communication. The people that have might have different background, different context, a little bit or a lot, right? They would take this word and they will assign their own meaning because this, this, you know, there's no definition for this in the English language. So that I'm saying, wow, well, languages are are today very inefficient, and if we if we have richer or more properly designed languages, which is maybe a whole discussion of hours and hours, you know, but if we have this kind of language, this can mitigate. Uh, uh, problems uh, due to differences in in context and, and you know and in background. Yeah, I, w- I would argue that that's actually an issue of context as opposed to the language, because this mm. idea of trade free because it wasn't really it didn't really exist, you know, and hence it wasn't in any dictionary. That means people don't have this cultural context in their heads, and doesn't matter. I think whether you invent a new word or you put two words together they if they don't have that cultural context you have to explain this new idea to them you know and, and i would actually argue that it's better to have two pre-existing words because then they can have some sort of idea of what this idea may mean if you name it like fluxio <laughs> then they have <laughs> no context at all you know yeah that, exactly but, but they, they, context, they would be so- they would be forced to go and and look for it. They, there's no there's less room for a mistake. Okay, because if they, but it won't they exist in words, dictionary. well, yeah, but you can put it online. Okay, Google is a dictionary, mm-hmm. right? So people can look for it. Uh, I don't say I don't but think you should, you you should change. Online. I'm not saying that you should change trade free to <laughs> Proluxio or whatever. But I'm just saying that uh, the limitation of our languages, okay, uh, uh, make it so that differences in context. Are, exam- are, are, are amplified, okay? So instead of just mitigating that by saying, okay, there's a new word for it and whatever, now there's no mistake, okay? Very few people would take this word and assign it some meaning because there's no background for it, okay? This word is not a combination of some other words. And what people would usually do, take the words trade and free and infer a meaning based on their understanding what trade and free is. Okay, and that creates a lot of bias and, and, and mistake. And yet, I'm not saying that you know I, I still think that context and background of people is number one. But I'm saying you know we we, we we should also have a proper language if we want, because you know, there, there's not two people that have the same context and the same background, right? You can just go close, and uh, how close you are is one factor in how effective you would be communicating. And then which language you use or how properly designed this language is would also affect that, okay? Still, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget to when you invent a new language. When you invent a yeah. new language, it, it suffers from the same problems, you know, of context. If you invent a new word instead of trade free like this creature here, you know, people have to go and understand what this creature is with the same words that are still sub- the same kind of words. Like, okay, what is trade free? What is Felix or whatever? And we explain all oh, about this trade and money. And we explain the same things. You know, what is Trom? You know, people have to know about Trom. There is no such Trom in, in any dictionary, right? So right. You, you go back to the same the, the, the same problem. You know, even if you invent new words, people have to understand those words. And you have to understand those words with language, with other words. 
what are words if not other words, you know, described with other words. So there are, I give examples in, um, other example in the book, something like, uh, here's the thing, because this is very important, because maybe it goes to what you are trying to say, the efficiency of uh, language itself. So they look at, for example, for uh, in US, in the English language, there is no day, and there is no uh, word for the day after tomorrow. In Romania, we have all kinds of words for all the mm -hmm. days of the week. You know, uh, there are so many languages where you have one word describing a complex thing, and this doesn't exist in other languages. You know, you have to use a fucking huge sentence. Well, guess what? There is no difference in communication between people in Romania and people in in US, despite all of this difference. There is no difference between people in Italy and people in China. In China, they have a different kind of writing system. Very, very different. You know, they use signs. They basically draw what they want, want to say. So based on all of these examples, I'm not just saying these things. I'm, I'm saying with examples. Uh, these things are studied. You know, we're not the first ones to question if, if we improve language, would that improve communication? And the answer from everything I have gathered is no, kind of no. It doesn't make much, if any, any difference. The best example I found in this book is this tribe who doesn't use, they don't understand the meaning of front, back, left, right, up, down. They use south, west, uh, east, north, right, in their culture. And they, they seem to orientate themselves in space very, very well because they use those. They know they know where the, they, they can navigate better, they, apparently, right? But the thing that when they did study about this and say, okay, are people from this tribe better at navigating because they use a much better, more exact um, meaning of what is front and back end and so forth than people in New York. And they realize that no, kind of not. They Both of them get us confused and both of them get us good at co at, uh, at uh, navigating. And this is kind of the, uh, the high point of studying influences of language on communication because this example is quite extreme. They, there are, are many people like this one in these tribes and that they, they have multiple other, uh, like if they say, oh, it's a spider in the south, you know exactly where it is because you know where South is. But the thing is that they only know that in their own little culture there based on uh, landscape and so forth. But, but the idea is that even in this extreme situation, you know, it doesn't seem to make any difference you really by using different words. Words and communication, you know, yes, they're intertwined, but it's all about the context. It's, I don't know how to explain why it's difficult to explain a 600 pages book. It took me a year to finish it. And then several uh, courses later. But if someone is interested in that, I recommend you you read that book. And that's my stance on the subject. I will not uh, want to make language better. I will not focus on that at all. I will focus on making uh, education better, making having more free time for people. You know, better content and so forth. Forget about the language. We can have a thousand languages on Earth. I, and I changed my mind. That's what I'm saying here. I used to think. That improving language improve communication, and I changed my mind. I don't know what to say. That's what evidence showed me. So yeah, I'm like, <laughs> when you when you talk about evidence, you say about okay, there were some research that was done on some languages in the world, okay, and it's it's I don't know what it uh, or, you know I don't know the specific research that, you, that you're saying, but the, the fact that there were some research that done on some languages that demonstrated there was no uh, difference in whatever doesn't mean that there is no way to, be, to do a language that would, that would, would affect and would make uh, us communicate better with less mistakes and more efficiently. So uh, a, a, the amount of languages in the world are, is very limited, okay, that are actually used, uh, okay, that you can actually make statistics and do research. And B, I don't think that what you said would apply when you compare classic languages, for example, to scientific languages, okay? For example, in science, you, you do have tons of words that are being invented all the time, unlike the English languages, which you don't, okay? And in science, you have much more specific uh, words that describe much more specific things rather than English that has, if we use English to, to, to describe to, in science, we'd be screwed, okay? So English as it is, I mean. If we call everything a particle, okay? Molecule is a particle, and molecule number 81345 is a particle, and a bacteria is a particle, and a virus is a particle. If we call everything a particle, then good luck doing science, okay? Uh, and in science, it's much, much well-defined, more well-defined, okay? You have a lot of con uh, co concepts that are conveyed using newer and newer words. I, and I'm not saying that's the best thing, okay? We can, we can think of even better things, but I'm just saying that's far better than using classic languages 
that are very limited and then you know you're stuck with the language uh, that yet you have okay i think that so, goes back to what he was saying before though is because scientists all have the same background and therefore the context is a lot easier to understand when they have very specific words and like the english language when you have these very specific words and you don't know the meaning and then you have to go look it up and then you might be even more confused sometimes like if you're reading a book and then you're like that's complicated whereas like if you're just using you know um simpler language and maybe use an analogy to explain it's much more understandable because you get more context that way. I don't know if that makes sense, but yes. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> who are you, fellow stranger? <laughs> <laughs> so who are you? Yes, you are you are live. Yeah, yeah. It's you now. The person is still talking. Yes. Okay. Okay. Oh, huh. Whenever you want <laughs> to say something, you can you can say <laughs> something, okay. <laughs> uh i wanted to, to mention that i think it's relevant when you the examples that i gave in the book that they also study language studies um it's relevant when you study existing languages and say see some are very complex some are very simple uh and you draw a conclusion that okay it doesn't really make any difference depending when you where you tweak this thing more simple more complex uh, just because you're saying well yeah but what if we invent a new one that is much better i think okay un until we do that Okay, we can theorize that. Okay, maybe we can do a better one. But from all of the evidence that we have, tweaking language to make it more complex doesn't seem to improve communication. And yes, you give the example of science. Yes, you can call this t cloud uh, that's very uh, opaque in the sky. You can call it Andromeda Galaxy. You can see it through a telescope from Earth or M45 or whatever they call it, right? You can choose those words. Why do they use M45 and so forth? I think as far as I understand, they use mostly for not for improving their communication, but just labeling things better for their scientific research and mostly computers that can be can use these numbers easily and so forth. But our day-to-day -day communication is different. We are we are faced with such a dynamic world that is always in change, it always moves. You know, I can we cannot put invent new and new words. Actually, I put that in the book, but I don't have the statistics now. But if people remember very few words out of all of the words. Let's put this again in context. There are in the English language. 250,000 words right now. I use just a thousand words for all the books that I wrote. That's nothing compared to 250,000. Why aren't people using those English words instead of combining existing new words, the few that we know? Because it's difficult for us to remember so many words. You know, it's a limit there how much people can remember. That's why we call that fucking thing the dragon reptile. You know, it's easier to understand, you know. What what names do you think they use in biology, for example, to name plants, to name animals? They use Latin words, and that don't stand for anything really. They just Latin words. Whoever the fuck discovered it can be named like Joe Billy Bo. You know, it's it's not that important. So I don't know. Maybe you understand yeah, that, that or not. That, but <laughs> that that may be what allowed science to progress and culture stay in the same spot. Okay. So the view, you can make, build more complex stuff in science and technology due to the richness of language, maybe. Okay, maybe. I'm not saying uh, that's the, the, that I have 100% proof for that, but maybe that's what allowed science to progress forward, but culture is still staying in the same uh, spot because, okay, we have 30,000, 20,000 something words, but they're useless. Okay, we only use 1,000, okay? But in order, in order to convey complex ideas, we don't have words for it, okay? There's no word for trade-free. Okay, uh, with all those words, okay, we, we, we don't have anything close even, right? People would see trade free and say, oh, communism, I know what it is. That's communism, <laughs> fine, let's move on, okay? So these, com these mistakes are common in culture, but are very uncommon in science because the scientists wouldn't take the Latin word and say, oh, of course, I know what it is, let's move on, okay? No, they either really know what it is or they would look it up and then they would know what it is. So... Uh it could be an illusion because mostly scientists are well educated in their own domain so that's why they don't kind of disagree that's what makes them scientists in those specific domains now uh, the, the the leader of the leader whatever you call that the, the guy in charge of the sequencing the, the, the genome in the us like the, the top guy like whatever the fuck in the us he was brilliant he is a brilliant guy when it comes to genetics and biology but he's very religious and dawkins has this debate with a guy and he knows a lot more than dawkins know about evolution and about genetics and he can tell you so many words 
but he has a different interpretations of the same scientific words. He's not alone. There are many scientists out there who use the same scientific language but disagree with other scientists, you know. And the disagreement, I think, comes mostly when there is also uncertainty in the context. Like when you talk about the speed of light is something that we can measure it. It's something that is hard to debate. doesn't matter what language you use. But when you use something like evolution, which is a bit more difficult for some people to grasp, you know, can be leave room for misinterpretation. You know, this context is not that solid anymore. So what I'm saying is maybe it's an illusion when you say, ah, oh, but look at scientists, they get along better together because of language. I would say it's because of the context. Doesn't matter what language they use. In, in medicine, they use all kinds of words that we use, you know, in our day-to-day -day life from organs to whatever chemicals sometimes. So, or biology and then uh, naming uh, fr from flora to fauna, when we have so many Latin words and still it works, we can categorize stuff. People know what they are talking about. It's not like it's a confusion because of that. And th there are many people who try actually to, to categorize the world in, with a new language. There are all, all kinds of new invented languages to make it more useful and so forth. Let's see how that plays out. But so far it didn't seem to put any well, mark. Yeah, uh, uh, in, for example, if we find in common, okay, that works on uh, biology, okay, and I'm a physicist in the United States, okay, would be able to convey very complex idea on science very easily, okay, but then I step out outside and a person that grew in the same place in a very similar context sort of environment that I have, I won't be able to talk with them or understand or relate what they want, okay, so uh, I don't think it's, it's very definitive that, uh, you know, the, the, all scientists have very similar context or background. That's why, you know, they also have some tools, not only context, that they use. And these tools might make their communication more efficient. I didn't say they get along. Okay, you might be, I'm not friends of almost any scientist in the world. Okay, some. Okay, but I can communicate with other scientists very easily if I want to. But you should look at the uh, theories about the beginning of the universe. And you will see so many theories from brilliant people that they will argue to death, you know, with mathematics and physics, and they will disagree with each other. Why? Because I would say the context is different. You cannot pinpoint to specific things. But when that clears out, and it turns out that, yeah, it was a string theory after the Big, Big Bang, and these little vibrating strings became atoms, you know, then they will clear out. But right now, we don't know. And I've seen so many documentaries about like debate and debates between scientists. Like, was it a string theory? Was it like the big bounce or the big bang or the big rebounds? You know, there are all kinds. You will see so much disagreement there from scientists, top scientists, using their language, the, this sophisticated new language. You know, mathematics yeah, actually they you're, use and disagree. You give you take an example of something that's unknown on on the edge of science that's not explored yet, and people can argue if they have the same background because. When you talk about something that neither of us know very well, okay, we would just simulate stuff and invent stuff, okay, and my invention, your invention, whatever, we can discuss, maybe my mine represents reality better or not, whatever, but giving one example or some examples about where uh, even scientific language has challenges doesn't mean that the rest of what science does is exactly the same as whatever, as, as, as any other language, you know, that, and one example that shows some difficulties doesn't make, you know, the entire thing incorrect. Oh, no, but it kind of clearly showcases that even if you have this exact language, you can have a lot of disagreement and people yeah. not agreeing with each other. So that's important for our I end discussion. I never said it's perfect. Mm -hmm. I never said it's perfect, okay? I'm just saying that it is somewhat better than regular language, and we can think of other languages that would be even better. But obviously, nothing is perfect. There's no like, nothing is perfect. Constantly yeah, well, I'll still disagree that we can invent a better language and that will improve communication. But well, we can leave it at that. You can agree we to can, disagree, or <laughs> we can agree to disagree. <laughs> yeah, and I would recommend that that book and other discussions we had here because that links to also uh, courses, courses, lectures, you know, from linguists showcasing all of this in in great detail. Okay. No, but, but we could move on probably because we just, we are not even halfway and it's like two hours, 30 or something. <laughs> Got in there. Let's go quickly. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah.
uh, but I'm afraid that we are going to like make more stops because I see here in my notes. Um, <laughs> law, 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 law. So I discuss about law. laws, 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 laws. The law is in how laws are not quite uh, useful if you really want to stop a particular behavior. Uh, we discussed about laws before in Trumpcast, but one thing I wanted to say is that at one point I put a video with Jack saying, I think it's quite exactly says, uh, laws came into existence because of scarcity. If something is scarce, you know, you need a law to be like, don't steal or don't whatever. And I, right now I would say, with my understanding that laws, I don't know if they came into existence because of scarcity. I'm not sure. I do not know. At least I would say I would not know. But Today's laws are put there by all kinds of means, not just scarcity. There are all kinds of reasons that people put laws you know, in place. So something that I wanted to mention. If people want to comment then. Is it possible to extend that? First of all, hi, everybody. I didn't mean to sort of, mm -hmm. I, the back, uh, the video was still playing when I was came in. I heard uh -huh. the lady talking, so I was confused. Yeah, uh, yeah. hey, I'm Ludas. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't want to really ramble on about my background. I'm curious though. So. Mm -hmm. Do you want to maybe extend the possibility to say it's not just scarcity, it's just general lack of control. So you need a law because you just, you know what I mean? The same, bringing up Fresco's example. So there's no signs in the sky because you can't walk there. You need specific apparatus to get there. And when you do, by then you would have generally had approvals and safety controls and tests and all that stuff. Otherwise you're one of those people who jumped off, you know, Eiffel Tower and crashed into the floor. So, and if that's not true, then you have other control mechanisms. So, you know what I mean? It's, what about thinking it's not just scarcity, it's literally just because you don't have enough overseers, mm -hmm. either machines or humans of whatever it is you're trying to protect. Like, I mean, we're still probably talking about private property or things like that, right? If we are. Yeah, I think there are all kinds of, kind of, of reasons of works. I agree, yeah, with you. And there are all kinds of, all kinds of reasons to put laws Mm. into place to protect someone's business to to protect someone's so-called rights whatever you may mean by that you know it's like uh i know in uh, when i was writing the orange and most problems i was looking at internet you know and how it, they ban certain websites you know, so those are laws and there are all kinds of weird laws sometimes in, in australia i didn't expect that but it's like if you if you like attack someone's uh, religious background or something that could be seen as uh, illegal and your website can be taken down or something. So there are all kinds of reasons for laws to come into existence. But I would say overall, since they don't address the problem really, hardly they do much, you know, to, to stop particular behavior. All right, uh, rules were made to be broken. Yeah. <laughs> or for good people. Uh, right, yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Oh, yeah. For good people. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Alex. Yeah, I think like it, like the purpose of laws is modify human behavior, right? And of course, laws modify our behavior to some extent. I just don't think a they modify it. Uh, it they they don't modify it how the, the one that wrote the person that wrote the law actually meant it to do, which is one problem. And second problem, you know, people that try the laws, their intentions are do not align very well with what, pe what the people actually want. So that's a second major problem. But I think that laws, like I cannot deny that laws do affect human behavior, right? You're like, you're not going out, hitting people, shooting people uh, or whatever, like, or doing crazy stuff or going naked outside because there are laws that would you know to force you to go to jail or to get a fine, to take away your stuff. So you know, our, our, our behavior is very much affected by laws but it doesn't land very well with what we want our behavior to be. And this is where problems come in, you know. But maybe in most cases, like, why do you go out with a red pink dress? I don't think it's any law that will put you in jail for going in a red pink dress as a guy. You don't go because you don't feel like, you don't like, maybe it seems like ridiculous or something. I think most people don't do stuff because just don't do stuff. It's not in their culture. And those who want to do stuff, they will do stuff. They always break the laws. There is a law that you are not allowed to steal phones. Guess what? People steal phones all the fucking time here in our town, everywhere, you know? So I think, yes, you're right. Laws will influence behaviors here and there. Very rarely I would say influence the behaviors of those that they want to tackle, like the, 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 the thieves or the terrorists, yeah. you know? Those mm -hmm. will not care. I don't think terrorists give a fuck about Spain saying you're not allowed to, wear a, to have a weapon. They will take a car and they will ram over people, you know, if they really want to do that. I don't fucking give a shit. You know? That's yeah, the overall think, idea of those. Yeah, because I don't think most people don't go out of their house and shoot a bunch of other people. 
just because it's against the law. You know, most people don't want to do that. Right. Yeah, laws just have like a, a small effect on people's behavior. Yeah, but obviously, they don't, yeah. Obviously, like, you know, if somebody wanted to steal something from the store, they might not because they're scared of getting caught. But does that stop people from stealing? No. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I was simply going to say that actually that kind of probed me to think about um, further extending. It's not just the law. So look, the good example also, religion. You can argue in the same or similar vein saying that, okay, well, if people weren't religious, they would go out and shoot and all that. Because a lot of the Christians or Catholics, at least that I watched or seen debate with other you know, scientists or whoever, they bring up, oh, if people weren't X, they would Y. And it's like, well you're already eliminating the huge swathe of people who are a different religion, for instance, and they're not out there doing why or atheists and they're not out there doing why that already fails just as a thought experiment. So I I think I'm just sort of trying to think like what sometimes I think even during the language segment, I was just curious, what's the purpose? Like what, what were you guys, is there ever a central, a core idea that you're trying to peel over and when you do find it, you just move on to the next or do you just sort of try to tackle as many different corners of an idea as possible before moving on? Yeah, I would say it's mostly, in my view, uh, how this monetary system or trade-based society influences all kinds of aspects of our of our of our behavior, of our, the way that we live life. So laws are one of them that this is how they try to like put laws and in this society laws are not like to protect people maybe, but they're also because they want to protect their, uh, some properties, you know, some belief systems, some whatever. So it's influenced by this, this society. That's the unpeeling of it. I would say same with language, you know, language. Why don't you have a, a better designed language or why don't people get along that well because people are quite separated in all kinds of groups and uh, you can expand on that a lot uh, how we are putting bubbles online and we have different kinds of contexts that's why we don't get along with each other so the system affects that was my point here with the, this entire like taking many subjects the system affects many many aspects of our lives you know because people think that these things might be different well they are kind of influenced by the same trade-based society that people put their own interests first many, many times, you know. So that's what I'm going with. Thanks. No, it's low. It's no problem. And if you, uh, you know, that we're, so we're discussing the Trump documentary and these are just the pieces of it that it's mm-hmm. divided into. Yes, yeah, so we just wanted to like make some make some points like 10 years later, like hopefully people will see the documentary and then we'll also see the, the critic <laughs> of it. And I think justice, you know, that this is another part of the documentary is similar. You know, in this world, you have this uh, almost perverse idea of justice, but it's kind of what the fuck is justice? Because if you have a better lawyer, you know, you'll have, have better justice or <laughs> what is justice? You know, uh, isn't justice the same way influenced by this system? Because when, when Apple enslaves people in Taiwan for mining all kinds of uh, resources, of work, you call that opportunities for those people. You know, you don't call that as an abuse because they pay them very poorly. Or they, when Apple avoids or rather taxes and so forth. Uh, so where is the justice really in this world? I don't think there's anything as, as such as justice, you know, it's difficult. Yeah, justice is like a perspective, basically. Yeah, that's what I would say too. Because somebody could go out and shoot a crowd of people and might think they're getting justice over something bad that happened to them, <laughs> like, you know? Re- revenge, is- yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, maybe we can skip a few so we can go further. Because I'll just match a few into into one. I talk about um, consumption and how in this society they make uh, products that are not that good quality because that also works for them, you know, because they they have to sell all the time. I talk about you know how even food and water it's is controlled in this in this system. You are born on this planet. You're not even able to eat or to just survive unless you are part of the system. So to me, that's that's a bit crazy since the only way to participate in the system or the main way is to trade your life away for that, like your energy, your skills, you know, I do something to give me the food and so forth. So I point these things out. Same with health, you know, like it's crazy that in the US, I was reading these days, like it costs in US an average of 
$460 per ambulance call. So if you call an ambulance, that's the average, you know, of course there are less and <laughs> bigger amounts there. Average and 71% of this is not covered by any health insurance of all of these uh, ambulance calls, whatever. For a helicopter, it's like <laughs> uh, 22,000 or something, which is insane, at least here in Europe, in Spain, you know, I'm not concerned to call any fucking one. It's insane, you know, they're, both are fucked up in this system, in a way, because these people also rely on taxes and so forth, but it's much better this way, at least for now, right now, than like in the US where you are afraid. I don't know how the fuck people live in the US and not being afraid all the time. Probably they are. Like, oh my God, I'll break a leg and then I'll get bankrupt. Jesus Christ, that's to me, it's insane. It's complete insanity. You uh, seen the documentary, Michael Moore, Sicko? That's quite a... yeah. Sharp I even picture. link in the in that video <laughs> to that sticker. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it, 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 we talked talked about health in the past, of course, but uh, yeah, I, I wanted to mention that I didn't know coming from this environment where health care was kind of free, like I can go to the hospital, and then hearing the situation in US to me, it's just outrageous how are not people in the streets saying this is fucking insanity are you crazy you can, can go bankrupt like sasha was telling me because she's <laughs> she grew up in us that some people are scared were scared sometimes uh, to to for others to kill to call an ambulance for them you know like i, ha I have a problem and some calls an ambulance for me i'm like no don't do that you know i'm fine they refuse to get into the ambulance because they're like i can't afford to spend mm two grand on a ride to the hospital let alone the hospital itself it's crazy it's not insanity yeah. it happens when you have like a car accident and they send a helicopter to rescue you and you might be unconscious and so you have no control you just you you know you have to pay like fifty thousand dollars or something like that for for a helicopter ride to the hospital and you have no control over that yeah. and it, Health insurance wouldn't usually cover something like that. Yeah. That's crazy. That's just inhumane. That's all you can say. It's inhumane, especially for a tribe like US, who pretends to be oh so big and powerful. If you don't care about your citizens like this, then then I don't think I don't think you really care. You just care of making more and more shit. But again, but yeah. it explains mm -hmm. why there's so much conflict here. I mean, it's just so much violence in this in this culture alone the american tribe is just always everybody's always at each other's throat you know it's kind of a joke they call it the united states because it's like so divided <laughs> you know? the divided states yeah, everybody everybody hates everybody it's just like that's all you see on um like social media is all these videos of people that you know people are taking with their cell phones in the streets of just people arguing over every little thing you looked at me why are you looking at me? You know, it's like, I'm calling the police. It's crazy. <laughs> I think it's a lot to do with, you know, how expensive it is just to survive here and and how restricted you are. Yeah, this is insane. Yeah, the fact that you can die, like I put in the documentary, you can die because you don't have some pieces of paper. You, you can be saved. They have you know? the means to save you, which is insane. Yeah, you can be saved, but it's like you don't have those those useless piece of paper how ridiculous we have become yeah. that's how it is how sad and inhumane you know you just let this person die it's incredibly in, uh inhumane like people in flint michigan i think i believe they're still without um drinkable water yeah. you know and it's just so it's so crazy especially when you look at the military you know how how much technology and resources and go into the military as opposed to just, you know, basic necessities. People don't have drinkable water, but yet, you know, or even like housing, most of the, I watched this thing in like the really poor areas of the United States that um, you can literally be not only kicked out of your apartment if you're one day late on your rent, but you could also be arrested. And these are in the poorest parts of the United States where people can barely even make an income to begin with. I mean, it's just so crazy. Yeah. There's just one more example. 
it could be tiring, you know, for people to listen to all of these examples and mm. bitching mm -hmm. about stuff. But that's kind of how the world is. What the fuck? What the fuck is it? They also talk there about all kinds of like peace and freedom. People, people want to have peace on this world and freedom, but they don't go deep enough to understand what's okay. Why don't we have those? You know, what prevents prevents peace from happening? Or what do you mean by free or freedom? Of course, freedom is this kind of like almost like nonsense view. Like no one is free really, and especially in today's worldwide societies, who, who the fuck is free to do what? To just go in the US and go on the streets and then yell at the president. Do you think that's free? You know, when tomorrow you go to work to fucking slave away? I don't know. Yeah, it works, you know, weapons and uh, talk about that to how these guardians of of our wonderful world are, um, you know, protecting, protecting this world and how mindless. If you think about like police officers, oh my God, sometimes you're wondering what the fuck is wrong. I know that you cannot generalize really, but it's crazy that they just are there to just defend, you know, just defend whatever it's, is there like people in Nazi, Germany and others, they did the same, you know, I don't want to accuse them. You shouldn't accuse people. I'm saying the environment is, is this way. Of course, they also pay them maybe better and have, you know, it's incentivized. So. Uh, sorry, Lulas, you wanted to say something maybe, and I, I forgot you said something. You raised your hand at one point, and now I just remember. <laughs> That's right. I did. Yeah, I did. Not too late. I just jump in at any moment. Guys. That's yeah, fair. I just, I just still, I'm trying to kind of learn the modus operandi of you folks, and how, how do you, you know, do you mind being interrupted, and would you even consider interruption? Um, previously, about the inhumane, I don't know. I, it seems appropriate, man. I, have you ever, ever actually personally, sort of just person to person, spoken about this whole? Do you want free healthcare the way that it is? And then you name some European country. Have you ever, any of you, done that with people? Yeah, it's, yeah. people here don't want it. They, um, uh, well, it's divided. But a lot of people you speak with, they don't want it because they think in the long run it's going to cost them more money. So that's all they're instead of thinking about the benefits that's just my experience but that's such a crazy thing because now it's like you're not just paying for the medical care itself you're also paying for this middle person which is this douchebag insurance company you're paying an entire industry on top of what you need for the healthcare system to run so how can they possibly think that oh in the long run it's going to be more expensive and you're also paying for all the people, like say homelessness, it's actually more expensive to have homeless people than to just give them the home and the necessities they need. You know, it's just so crazy. I asked only specifically because the idea um, seems to be quite pervasive. So one is like you said, yeah, oh, the economy without actually, so ignorance is really baked into the, the entire sort of ideology of, oh, okay, we don't need it. It's sort of like, well, okay, you don't need it until, and then it's too late or what have you. Um, but also I've spoken to really quite a lot of people who are treating it as though it's charity and they view the concept of charity extremely unfavorably. It's almost like, I'm not a cripple, get off me. I can pay for myself, you know what I mean? It's sort of like, a, right. I'm a rugged individual, get off me with your sort of liberal ideas and whatever. And, and really not much else penetrates. Again, this is few people, well, like 23 or whatever, but you know, it's not the entire continent. So it's different, like you said. Um, I forgot the war stuff too. I'll shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a good point that people, even if you want to offer these kinds of things to them, they, they might say, well, fuck off. You know, I don't need your help or this is not going to work or whatever. That's a good way to make people comfortable with this, this system and say, no, I don't, I don't need charity. Like, wh what the fuck is that attitude? You know, where is that coming from? I don't need charity. Okay. It, it's Fine. Such a... Sorry, let's go on because otherwise it's going to be very, very long. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to say something, we can. If not, we. Um... Okay, it's just like because you, most people are so dependent on uh, having a job that will give them health insurance so that they actually have health coverage. It's a complete, I mean, either way, it's a system of enslavement, but this is, you know, you can't get healthcare basically unless you work for some company. It forces you to be a part of the system, to be, a, you know, to be a slave. And to say that, well, the other ones don't have, like, get a fucking job or a proper yeah, one, yeah. you know? I worked for my, my health insurance. Yeah. 
And they don't um, deserve it, so why should I pay for them? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's a great environment to create uh, society. <laughs> because it's influenced by advertising. Because we also talk about advertising, how <laughs> how such a perverse fucking bullshit idea it is. I fucking hate that shit. I cannot say more bad words about this motherfucking dick <laughs> shit ass monkey <laughs> bullshit. I, it's it's awful. Like advertisement is it makes it will make no sense in the just in this society it makes sense, but the LC will not make sense. Like what the fuck are you doing here? Oh, I want to just Tell people about my product. Well, but, but, but why? Because I want people to get my product. You know, this is this crazy. Like, get my product. Not get my product. You know, mm -hmm. you know, get my phone. Get my phone. It's, and back then, when I was making this uh, documentary in 2010 ish, 11, uh, advertising, I was hating advertising anyways, but it wasn't at all like it is today. Today, advertisement is, you can't even know if it's advertisement or not from blog posts, from Instagram posts, from whatever the shit, it's such a crazy fucking industry. You know, if Facebook and Google, 80 to 90%, actually over 90%, I think, of the revenue comes from advertisement. How can you call those social networks? You know, they're not, they're ad networks. You know, they that's what mm -hmm. they do, they deliver ads. You know, so it's, it's a huge topic anyways about advertisement, but I think it's just the cancer of this fucking society you know well, we're one of the cancers yeah you know yeah, and it's extremely invasive <laughs> these days right yeah yeah that everybody's kind of getting you're gonna have your own personal ad experience kind of thing and, mm -hmm. um, and yeah. so fucking sneaky like mm -hmm. look at any mm -hmm. like top instagram people every single post is an ad and people are like oh, yeah, look at oh wow yeah. yeah positive associations <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like put, like, yeah. Going back to the free healthcare thing where people are like, well, I don't mind it. I, I kind of like being shown the things I want. I'm like, no, but it's the way they're going about doing this. Like, I mean, it's just everything. It's just sucking up all your attention. It's, it's just, there's so many things that are awful about it. And yeah, and also it does, it perverts, um, like even an article, you want to, you just want to know the facts and you can't even get to that, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's a huge fucking ad show. Not a shit show, but an ad show. Like um, I remember this when I wrote the origin most problems. I give this example of this dude Cristiano Ronaldo. He's like a big fucking superstar in like soccer world. And he's one of the most followed on Instagram. And he has this post among so many others like, with the fucking shampoo. And he's like just tagging the fucking shampoo company. I think it was like over three million likes. Hundreds of thousands of comments. I'm like, are these people fucking morons? Are they bots? What the fuck are mm. they? What's the what's the problem? And people comment, oh, that's a great hair. That's a great shampoo. Oh, oh. I'm like, are these really people? Because that's sad if they are people watching an ad and being so like, oh, that's nice. You know, not only that they're not outraged, that's fine. It's normal. And what I worry about, well, anyways, but what I worry about is that kids who who like ten year old kids or whatever. They are so used to this world because of their phones. They grew up in this uh, society that for them, ads are just part of the thing. You should take it for granted. It's like the air around, you know? Of course, there are ads. Look at the Google Play Store, which is the biggest app store in the world, probably. Um, most apps there are free. Of course, they're not free. You know, they want your attention. They are based ads. They put ads in your face or make transactions or collect the data. And people are used to that. Oh, there's so much free shit. No, it's not. It's not free. No, if you don't understand it, you might think it's free. Not free. Yeah. I find it interesting. The time that you, I, the first time I've ever actually got introduced to Adblock Plus was due to your article in TVP Magazine, mm -hmm. and apparently, even for you, the probe was the SciShow. So, literally, a YouTube channel who are so also very scientific, and now there they go literally have an outburst against a person who does have a, let's say a sentiment or a value system like you've just expressed, which is, it makes you fucking puke and it's disgusting. And now here you are under attack. How dare you take away my revenue? This is the way I make money. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like, it's a very interesting, it's, you know, sort of like uh, reinforcing the example of Fresco's terminology of the uh, unappointed guardians of the status quo. And it's like literally the people who are now going to tell me about, oh, the climate change. You should really care about climate change. Don't you fucking disable, you know, the ads on this because this is how I make my living. It's like, 
but then you accept the parameters of the society within which you live where that's required. So now all of a sudden, like I'm, I'm on your side. I, it sucks that you're in this position, but then I'm now your enemy, yeah. enemy. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like, what the fuck is happening anymore? Yeah. It can, yeah. uh, yeah, by the, by the influence. And then, I mean, with the adpocalypse and everything, it, you, you got like a whole chilling effect. What you, what people are now willing to talk about. Like, I mean, the coronavirus had like demonetization like crazy. So people were, uh, censoring themselves or not talking about stories and stuff because, so, I mean, it, it's, it's. Yeah, I mean, it's opened up its whole other can of worms uh, in terms of like censorship and like what we can even talk about or are willing to talk about because now our our ability to live is tied to what we talk about kind of thing. So, thank Rumba. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, we're, yeah, oh, we're on number we're three right now, I think. We're working on the third adpocalypse right now. <laughs> okay. I, I'm wondering if we are going to finish with the documentary soon. <laughs> Let's see. Maybe. <laughs> okay, we talk about even like these notions of beauty and design and how they are influenced by, by our our f fast fashion society and how really nonsense they are. They are quite arbitrary. It's not such thing as that's beautiful as if it's uh, like universally beautiful. You no, know? they they just promote all kinds of shit. Like instead of Jack also gives these examples. Um, uh, make, making a chair, for instance, in this world, you are more prone to make it like a cool chair, right? I went, like, I see you, you just have a racing chair, like kind of like mine. I wanted to buy um, a chair that is good for my back and so forth. I couldn't really find any. I just went for the gaming, in the gaming category. I, I don't game at all. My laptop is a gaming laptop. It says here, Republic of Gamers on my laptop. I don't fucking game, you know, <laughs> but, but I cannot find it because it's not like a market for me. What about a laptop for writers? I couldn't fucking find that with a great keyboard. I cannot fucking find that <laughs> shit, or very rarely. So yeah, they focus on this, uh, whatever, whatever. They don't care about uh, its function or whatever. It's just beautiful. It's nice. It's cool. Look at this edge-to-edge -edge motherfucking phone, you know. Oh, edge-to-edge, -edge, you know. What's next? It'll make the back also, you know. And then foldable, and then so small that you cannot even have a phone anymore. It's in your wow. fucking head, you know. <laughs> Yeah. And too, uh, there's also a great book uh, about beauty and design. Mm -hmm. Ah, the be ugliness of beauty. Oh, ugliness of beauty, yeah. 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 yeah I think you did yeah. a great job with that as well. Oh, thank you, my wife. Standing the <laughs> okay. Same about talent and creativity. We did a much better job with this book that Dima wrote, um, The For-Profit Entertainment. It's quite a great book, much better than the, the video that I made for the Trump documentary to showcase how in this society, this entertainment, entertainment industry, it uh, doesn't promote anything that's like so-called talentedness or, and uh, creative. It's just to make money, but he presents it very, very well because he's in the industry. He's, he, he's a musician and he has dreads, so he's really in the industry, you know. It, it's a great book, yeah. I think it's uh, it's what do you call talent? You know, what do you call call as being creative? I know Jack is this example of, um, you know, when you you teach kids how to write, you know, we if they write a word that's written wrongly, you tell them, hey, you write wrote cats, whatever. Why don't you do the same when you draw? You know, and teach them how to draw. I think that would be a fantastic thing for people to learn how to fucking draw because sometimes you have some ideas or you want to express yourself that could be useful. No one teaches you that because what you want to be a painter, you want to make like an art show gallery, you know, it's all about uh, careers, careers, you know. Yeah, sense of ownership, social status, self confidence, family and love. You know, we go to all kinds of things. I'm not sure which is it's, it's quite pointless to go one by one. Let's see if it's. If it's one that needs more attention, I think what needs more attention is the question and the collapse one. It's towards the end question. when I talk about well, this monetary system. Um, first of all, asking all kinds of questions. No, is, is it okay for you to accept this system when you are kind of enslaved all of your life? And just asking questions, you know, make, maybe make people question this fucking system somehow. I will ask the question for you. The questions for you, maybe you will. You will get imprinted in your brain somehow. But uh, what I also discussed, and there's something that I kind of disagree today with, 
it's this idea of a collapse. You know, back then, I remember it was 2008 or so when there was this big uh, fucking crash, like Wall Street. Who street? Our street. Who street? Our street. Wall Street, you know, bankers get like kill the fucking bankers and all that shit. I was like, oh my God, it's happening, you know, it's crashing, it's fucking, it's there. Like TVP became popular, Zeitgeist became popular. I made this documentary and I was like, it looks like the system could collapse, you know, but I don't think that anymore. Let's talk a bit about that. So the arguments, as far as I can tell, generally were like <coughs> uh, automation. Automation is starting to replace more and more jobs and replace so many jobs that uh, at one point, like production is, is very high, but the automatic jobs are low, low, lower and people cannot have the purchasing power. They can't fucking buy shit. So that it leads to a collapse of the system. And right now, after 10 years of going to a few scares of the sort, like, oh, no, we collapsed in 2012. No, I think 2015 or oh, 2020 with the coronavirus. You know, I realized that this system is really resilient. Like, I think, uh, I think we are going to suffer. Uh, I'm going to suffer endlessly. You know, I feel like it's not going to be like a big collapse or like, oh my god, that's it. You know, no more monetary system. I think we're going to just suffer endlessly if we don't do anything to change it, because it kind of adapts. Like, can you talk if you want to talk about this automation replacing jobs? What do you guys think? Is that like a relevant thing? Well, like with um, uh, like say self-driving cars, they were coming up with new jobs. Like, yeah, the the if it takes away taxi drivers and Uber drivers, they'll just put you on a self-driving car, and now you're serving drinks to people riding on the car, so you'll still have a job. So I don't think automation's going to get rid of jobs per se. Like you said, I think the system will just keep finding ways to. To, to stay alive perpetuate like with, if, like with coronavirus if it stays so bad they will eventually do like a universal basic income or something you know they'll just keep giving us enough money to keep putting it back Playing. Into, yeah let us know yeah i was uh yeah, i was kind of pleased that Theo, you refer to essentially when you thought that automation is going to break stuff. Cause I, I still remember looking at Facebook and so, seeing your uh, post with great disappointment in your writing saying, you know, it, like I really thought, you know, five years ago that at least by now we would have essentially reached some sort of plateau, something visible, you know what I mean? Something visible to the degree of like bread lines and shit, something that deeply upsetting and, and concerning and scary. And it just never came. And it instead does, this other thing, which I don't know, is it uh, worth to kind of combine the automation with the concept that David Graeber, so social anthropologist US, talks about bullshit jobs. And he literally just mm -hmm. puts it in quotes, like a concept of bullshit jobs and essentially miles long queue of essentially middlemen, just this new generation of middlemen. Your job is literally not needed even to function the very company who hires you, but they do it. And I don't actually remember the crux of why that's allowed to continue or how th is that not a draw on the company's revenue to begin with, but it's just constantly perpetuated. Obviously the other um, line is like you said, I mean, if the automation is let to just continue super producing, you just, we reach the, um, literally the title header of uh, the documentary, humans need not apply. I, I, mm -hmm, like yeah. you've sourced it at some point. So it doesn't make sense because then genuinely, whatever that would mean, maybe it wouldn't be collapsed like, oh my God, the building's falling, but it certainly would mean something. I just, I'm not sure what, because your comment about the resilience of a system, I don't think yeah, I could have put it better either. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I would say that, you know, yeah, if you're talking about the trade system, you know, you're talking about us trading shit, using money, using cryptocurrencies, whatever social credits, I don't see that collapsing. You know, I see it, you know, a lot of people suffering from all kinds of problems, from climate change, disasters, and all kinds of more shit. But people will, con I feel like people will continue and continue to trade shit. And I, I don't see how a collapse would even look a collapse of the trade system. That would mean we'd have to, we won't trade anymore. So, <laughs> I yeah. Uh, Maybe it's going like to be the collapse of the monetary system and it's going to be, in, in a sense, that it replaced 
more and more by social credits, more and more by data trading, more and more by all kinds of this bullshit jobs that you get mm. something in return, like a Instagram models kind of fashion, maybe in that sense, but it's fucking resilient. It's resilient because it's, it can create bullshit out of nowhere anytime. You know, look at the US. Oh, no more money. Well, why don't we just print a few trillion and give mm -hmm. to people? <laughs> yeah. What about that? And they will do that all the time. And if they, the debt, debt is so high, they will be like, what if you don't erase that? at one point or erase half of it or they will do these kind of things that's why but the important part here was that i relied on the collapse at least mentally uh like others did as well in that past because i felt like if we get this collapse we could kind of start something different you know it was this feeling of like okay this is all wrong there are so many things wrong with the system hopefully we're just going to fucking crash right and we can create something new something better and that I do not see anymore. I feel like I feel like this is not going to happen from my knowledge now, from my life experience now. I don't know. I don't know what you guys think. Like Alex, what what do you think? As you you are at TVP, and um, I know I'm discussing with another guy from TVP Guild or something, and I discussed a lot with him, and he kind of says specifically that from if his, his view, something like he he and tvp waits for the system to collapse i don't know if that's tvp's stance to like create something new but that's what what kind of he he implied you know <laughs> yeah that's a reasonable thinking well a i i don't subscribe to you know just one problem one solution i like i i, I sort of look for you know more pro like a few few major problems and then few different solutions i think they work together and like i I don't, I don't uh, represent. I don't like representing TVP or whatever. You know, I can express my my opinion from my observation. Uh, TVP is uh, is a lot about uh, uh, providing that you no know, future solutions that might be useful to humanity. You know, if MNT arrives at that point where it's you know where it it overcomes whether there's like a collapse or you know some evolutionary process that arrives to that. So, TVP creates those assets or knowledge how a society can be built or designed in order to avoid these problems in the future. But there's no like there's no I don't see any concrete plan uh, of TVP of saying okay how we get from here to there. Okay, there was some you know let's do the, uh, a, a picture <laughs> movie or whatever you know that that's not a plan that's just uh, so so there's no real plan like I don't think TVP uh, does and maybe it won't uh maybe it will okay but i don't think tvp now has a plan or solution of how to get there okay and this is where additional projects might may contribute okay like trom if you know sort of trom is sort of i think maybe more in the short term solutions of saying okay we we need to do trade free now okay like not waiting for whatever let's do something now and tzm sort of in between uh tzm sort of saying yeah we need to act we need to do stuff but TZM is very, very inclusive and it says, okay, let's take these guys, they do this, and these, these guys do that, and the third group that does something else, a third idea. So I think that's why I talked about collaboration because I think what we need is, is all of those things, right? We need like the, the long-term plan or you know the, the optimal, most optimal solution, and we need a plan together, and we need to understand what we need to do today and tomorrow and, and so on. So I think all of these are required. So I am I do not subscribe to any camp, okay? And I say, okay, this camp, this is what we should do, okay? I don't think there's uh, one organization that has all, all of the answers. And I try to take you know, the best of everyone. Mm -hmm. I think this is a good segue towards the the next part because we'll skip the technology one i'm, I'm talking about how <laughs> we have um, basically lots technology can allow us to create this world of automation and um, abundance because this is another thing that i i, I was talking about here uh, the team was that uh, you know as alternative solutions we have to provide an abundance of goods and services and so forth uh i don't even know if how to open this can of worms now <laughs> mm -hmm. but um because we discussed a lot in the past about this, but the biggest maybe change for me if, since this documentary happened is uh, what will follow ne the next part, is like the resource-based economy part. <laughs> this is what I kind of changed. I kind of changed the way that I think about 
solution and so forth. In, in all honesty, I presented TVP and the research-based economy as an alternative solution. I didn't think that, okay, that's it. That's it, we have to implement this, you know, but I thought that it's a really nice set of ideas. Um, uh, I don't think that uh, you can imagine the future much. I think it's, it's going to be so different that it's a, a, any shot at this will be at one point rendered as, as ridiculous probably you know unless you make it a bit uh, make it very vague like oh if people will not have to work you know and they should have more free time you know or if you rely more on automation so people don't uh have to provide their work so they are getting slave in a way but having a more detailed plan of how the society could look like in terms of education transportation cities in terms of managing people's lives overall how that will look like uh, jack talks about main things uh, like relationships and language and lots of other things and to me always always was inspirational but i i don't see more than that today i see tvp and the resource-based economy as a really nice set of ideas inspirational ideas but it's something that i will not even i, I stopped pronouncing rbe since like 2012 I don't think I put that in any books. I, I, I was kind of against that thing because I was like, I don't know what that means. Uh, I was always confused to not... To, uh, it's hard to discuss about this unless we have lots of time to discuss about this. And we discussed in a previous podcast about RB and TVP and explain them better. But overall, what you have to take from this is that I think the resource-based economy is an inspirational idea. It's a great inspirational idea. But in my mind, it's it's extremely far from how the future probably will look like. And it has some good parts, but it also has some parts that to me are confusing, like focusing on scarcity and trying to create an abundance. We already have an abundance of, of goods and services all around the world. It's just that they're not accessible to us. Uh, I want for you to like comment on this and I can I can comment. You know, you just wanted to, to say something and we can go from there. Uh yeah, no, I, I can see some of the concerns and whatnot. To me, it was always sort of fascinating also that, you know, all these memes created by TVP as well. I mean, I appreciate the one where this leafy kind of branch hand grabs a human hand is like, it's not about technology, it's about uh, value systems and whatnot and ideas. Yeah, but which ones? And to me, honestly, I some of the most important, at least core concepts to me were always looked over, such as the systems analysis, right? Like the general systems theory, or what, you know, just when Fresco calls it Fres systems thinking. And that's essentially cybernetics. That's where you got a lot of this other stuff, the interdependent, interdependence, interconnectedness of things, stuff, people, matter, pushing matter, and then outcomes happening to the best of our ability and sensing, we can or can't observe the effects. But that's to me always the stuff. So the beginning is, okay, humans, uh, do you have empathy? Yes, check mark. We move to the next stage. If you don't, you're now dealing with all these aberrations, the psychopathy, et cetera, et cetera. That becomes a difficult topic, you know. Then if you have empathy, then you move on. Okay, free will. Well, no. Then check mark, we move forward yet again. Because if free will, then, oh, you know, I just get to, we become this nonsensical idea and not really supported by any kind of literature anymore. I mean, more and more people with neurology and social <laughs> psychology are able to produce results which show that, well, actually, no, you're essentially a particular system bouncing around an environment. Uh, what the environment is, it depends on how your sensory, um, how your sensors will react to the stimulus of that particular environment. And then you kind of get into the whole idea of, okay, simplicity and complexity. That's why when you said you don't want to generalize, I was like, oh, why not, you know? Because that's literally the fastest way to get uh, forward into something conclusive. And I'm, I literally just mean conclusive. That doesn't, doesn't matter that people will agree on it. So long as they understand what the conclusion at least means, then that's fine. Then you can tell me about, ah, fascist, communist, whatever. Great, great, cool. But so long as we can define the terms and be like, okay, what do you mean by insert here? Oh, that's not what I've read. What have you read? Mm. I mean, a lot of that still relies on the, the whole idea of I want to win. A lot of the times, I don't know, when I speak to people, I do try to establish, okay, do you want to win or do you want to understand each other? They're not inclusive terms. They are mutually exclusive. And like, if you want to win, if you want to win an argument, it's not, this is, this is not going to go anywhere. Mm. But so I just want to stop here, right? So empathy, no free will complexity and simplicity of concepts. And then if we can define the terms, at least we can get to some sort of framework 
which we can at least recognize and, well, still going to be abstract because it's not here now, but at least it's something to work with. Does any of that make sense? I'm, I'm not sure exactly. I, I, I get the, the gist of it. Like you are saying, so we're discussing about this idea of a resource-based economy, right? What I was saying is that I don't see how we can think about a future society, even if you think in terms of systems thinking, uh, because it's too complex to ever imagine how a future society will look like. So we might as well, if you imagine that, keep it keep it in the fantasy realm and be like, okay, this is this is an idea about our society. But if you take it seriously, like I feel like TVP is taking like we have blueprints, and I talked to Rosen about that, and I asked her like, can you sh show me some of these blueprints to put in TV magazine at one point? Or at one point I was saying, I want to discuss with Jack and ask some questions about TVP. Why are round, why are dome houses better than square ones, for example? Can I give him many examples? Like with furniture, maybe it's, it's, it's more difficult to adapt to a round house. Uh, many other, or solar panels and so forth. I didn't get any answers and they sent me to the their book. That was a bit disappointing for me back then. But my feeling now, or after I made the documentary, is that TVP says in, in all seriousness that they have a blueprint for how the society could look like and have the blueprints. And I'm just doubtful of that. Uh, I'm very doubtful. I don't think you can imagine the society in any way that you would, you can start as a brand because uh, Alex and you can discuss about that if you want. Uh, TVP, as far as I know, has this plan of building a, a city, like a model of the society. And then that will get, it will inspire others to maybe build uh, more, you know, around the world. And maybe that will change the society. Is that correct, this kind of way of thinking? <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't want to come in because I didn't wasn't sure if you're addressing me. Uh, so yes. uh, I, um, uh, TVP doesn't have uh, blueprints because blueprint is a very detailed, you know, specifications of something. Uh, TVP developed, uh, aggregated, you might say, a lot, a lot of knowledge related to uh you know social social design and the way that i see that i know that tvp is positioning itself especially now as sort of a think tank in this field so if you are at a point where you uh, have the resources and have the openness of people to design a society the Venus project would be ready with those answers hopefully you know when the time comes and so the Venus project for example uh, the, the various project activities are not building almost anything. It's mostly uh, about uh, learning system uh, system theory, uh, learning uh, behavioral science, uh, <clears throat> learning like uh, uh, system design and stuff like that, and uh, developing these theories further. Okay, so when the time comes, this would be able. This would be applicable. Uh, so you know. The, these are the sort of the goals of the project. This is what the project currently mostly doing. So I think the expectations of people that say, okay, why is uh, TVP doing something now? Is th there's a mismatch in the expectation. TVP's, uh, uh, TVP's intentions or people that work for on the project that say that TVP is just, you know, organization. So it works well. There's no intention to do anything now. It's not like they're failing or we're failing or whatever. To do anything now, there's no intention to do anything now. The intention to do now is to research how a society should be built. That's it. Uh, it we we must have additional organizations, okay, that would uh, help the society to reach a point where you say, okay, what do we do now? Here are the answers. Okay, here are blueprints. Okay, now they're the word developed. So these are parallel efforts. I think that they are all required in order to reach. Uh, a society that's much better than what we have today. Yeah, I hope I, I, it makes sense. Because I see the, did, yeah. At what point would they see, like, as their blueprints or their ideas, you know, able to actually be integrated into something? Like, when will the time come? As you said, when the time comes, decades, can... maybe, maybe 10 years, maybe more. No, but, like, what, what determines that time? Oh, the, the amount of resources that would be would exist for the project, the amount of people that would be working on it, mostly. You so know. you're talking about building something then? Well, the research now that's being done is theoretical research, okay? It's like aggregating, so for, for example, uh, literature review, okay? It's taking all the knowledge that, that's out there today, 
of you know of uh, how uh, environment shapes behavior of uh, how to design a city, how to design an environment, how a, a large systems function. Okay, so these are theories that are developed by the project, and this is what it's set to do. Okay, there were never very concrete concrete plan of you know what all of us should do. Okay, there. Like, I I haven't seen any plan of, like that, and I have interacted with many different people on the project, and I was exposed to stuff. On the I'm project. reading on I'm reading on Venus Project's website, and they say the Venus Project has begun development of its next phase, the Center of Resource Management, and then they start to explain this facility will act as a stepping stone towards. So that says that the VP has begun something, because I also saw at one point that they ask for some, uh, they were thinking about some budgets. As far as I remember, it was 3 million or something by the end of 2009, 2020 or something. They had all kinds of budgets. You remember, Sasha, because we were all, like mm -hmm. talking about this and we were looking at the websites and because I wanted to see what they are doing today. So they seem to have this plan. And even here on the website, they talk about um, how they will deal with like tourism, like tourism will be like a part of revenue for this center for resource management and then food and agriculture and water and they have these ideas and that's where my skepticism comes from because i don't think i find it so difficult to organize a society even a city you know it's such a, such a complex thing a city there are people who built cities in, in the past of course they built even now like mazda city but they have less of an aim you know they just mostly like Technology based, you know, and lots of money behind, and nothing much different from what is built today. And if TVP wants to build this completely different society, that's where my skepticism comes from. Because how can you organize about uh, like healthcare and then water and the internet and all kinds of these little nuggets of things that are part of the society? I don't think you can organize that. That's what I'm saying. You understand? I don't think you can build a new society. I think a new society should emerge out of this society. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah. I think that both the like RBE, which is resource-based economy, uh, and Center for Resource Management are misleading because obviously in an RBE, RBE talks a lot about human behavior, okay, which is like what that has to do with resources. So uh, when we talk about RBE, we sort of include a lot, a lot of different things. The same as when you talk about trade-free, you're not, do not talk, talk about being quality and stuff like that which are ideas that are extend beyond you know the just the transaction of, of trade uh, so RBA is inclusive a lot of things not only resources and the same for resource management the purpose of the resource center for resource management uh, which is not being built there's no there's no there's no one stone that, that has been laid but uh, the purpose of that is to have a place where people where volunteers can come and work on developing all of those blueprints and knowledge and this will be a place where it will be sort of a museum, the same as there's a there's now a visitor centers uh, in Venus, Florida. So people the uh, people in Venus can come to Venus, Florida, and see sort of you know the beginning of something that might be you know a Venus city or an RB in the future. And the Center for Risk Management would have is supposed to have uh, a sort of museum, so it's something like the center in Venus, Florida, on a much bigger scale. It'll be more immersive, more interactive, and stuff like that. But these are all things that are eventually developing those blueprints and developing, you know, knowledge, and you know, being sort of educational, uh, allowing people to come in and learn about it more. Uh, yeah, but these are not like this. This is not an RB, okay? Neither Center for Risk Management nor what's now in Venus, Florida. Oh yeah, but but my point was that uh, I started to doubt that TV, TVP or any anyone can uh, envision a society and then try, try to build it someone fr fr from scratch as far as i understand you know yes you may say there are some stepping stones first you build these to educate people or whatever and then you move because i see on the website you know the next phase will be like moving creating an eighth of the city uh, you know and putting s some specific number of people there and then you radially build the rest of the city i even see some like drinking water needed and it's like thirty-seven thousand cubic meters per year like wh where are there this things coming from? Where is this study coming from? Is TVP working on studying these things? Or who is working on these things? Yeah, so, so eventually, uh, I, I agree, and every, everyone would agree that you cannot do it only in theory, and the purpose, or what I said, like I said, the purpose of the building the CFRM is further research. 
So you would build stuff and then try stuff and then you learn from that. And building like one eighth of a city or even building the first experimental city that uh, I know the project uh, TAP talks about, eventually is to understand better how this kind of society should be built. So with the current resources and the current amount of people working on it, it's only theoretical, but the plan uh, is to extend it and make it you know, an experimental city through which you would learn how to do it better and better and better, you know? So uh, that's sort of the plan. But that plan, eventually, the output of this plan is not a society, as you see. Eventually, the plan goes to one eighth of a city over a city. It's nothing close to a society. Uh, it's an experimental city. So it's sort of developing knowledge. It's sort of like if you think of a university or whatever, or, or a research institution uh, would develop some science, OK? And in a current society, eventually, this science is taken by people and implemented, or business people or whatever, implement this world. Uh, well, this is a bad example because it contains a lot of, you know, a fucked up element that do not work well. But this is sort of, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think that the, the TVP currently has the capacity to build or to modify all the society. It has the capacity of research and it has some capacity of education, you know, learning people and creating the materials and stuff like that. But there's no one now working on building or modifying existing society. Okay, there's 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 nothing like that. Like education, you might say, but you know, it's it's not a plan. There are materials that TVP uh, presents, but there's no uh, like there's no plan of how these materials would change all society and make us all you know whatever our beers. Uh, but if you think that yeah. that TVP had. Um... Like lots of money, let's put it that way, because money in this world means uh, power and resources. Do you think they could pull this kind of move? Do you think this move it's it's uh, uh, efficient? This move of like creating a model of the society to inspire the world to change. Do you think this move? Because that's what I'm mostly against now, not specifically TVP, but this idea of creating a model of the society and inspiring people with this model. Yeah, I think, well, these are a few different things. So I, I think, and, you know, this is not, uh, I, I, I'm speaking for myself. Uh, I, <clears throat> I think that uh, you cannot, like, it's, it's almost impossible to think of a model, you know, and then build it and that's it. Okay, this is a, a sort of evolutionary process that has to happen. And this, like anyone that, you know, involved with TVP would also tell you that obviously it will be an evolutionary process where you start with something and then you iterate on that and then you learn and you iterate on that. So, so that would sort of, I think that should be done. And the question that you ask whether uh, TVP is, uh, I don't remember the exact word used, but whether TVP can do it, okay, or is apt, uh, you know, to, to, to build, to do something like that, um, no, if it's efficient, my my question is if it's if it's a good way of going forward. That, that does not care. Maybe it's not about TVP, but it's a good way to, way of going forward. If you build a model of a society to inspire the world to change, is that a good way of going about? Do you think? What do you think about this approach? Yeah, my personal opinion is that as long as people are mostly immersed in other realities, which is what we have now, and they get a glimpse. Uh, into a better whatever or alternative reality uh, that would probably not stick just because of you know how the human behavior is affected you know you have people are conditioned okay they're exposed to some environment and if they're exposed enough it can modify the behavior in some direction but if you uh, uh, expose them to something there, maybe their behavior will be modified to some extent, but if you bring them back into the real world or, or you know, the rest of the world, then they would drift back very quickly. Okay, and uh, you, you, like you read Skinner and stuff like that, Skinner talks about you know, how behavior is acquired and how behavior decays, okay? So I think if you just put a person for a brief period of time into some environment, that's not enough to change uh, most people. Uh, what might be a plan, and this is not part of TVP, it's just, it's just my, uh, like my, you know, thinking uh, of it is that if you create an environment, which is sort of an RB on a small scale, simulated, whatever, uh, and you put some people in there, they would be, they would adjust with time, okay? They would adapt, change their value system and stuff like that. And then you bring 10% more people, 
okay and you let them adjust and you bring 10 percent more people and then let them adjust okay so on the theoretical level it can work okay because people are constantly exposed to this environment so uh they would they are likely to adapt to it uh and uh and you know even on the mathematical level you take x amount of people you add one if it still works you add another one if it still works you add another one and if it would work for any x then you can generalize it to the entire population so at least on the theoretical level this is one way of how you can you know accomplish something like that without destroying everything killing everyone starting from scratch okay mm -hmm. probably if you want yeah no. Sasha. like i'm a bit skeptical about that as well because for one thing you need you need to think about what is this environment that you're bringing this 10% more people and 10% more people and 10% more people into, you know, because what is going to be this environment? Because if you have, you know, this idea of an RB in one, you know, enclosed city, are these people not communicating with the outside world? Did you cut them off from like YouTube and Facebook and all kinds of bullshit, all kinds of ads? Are you, are they not visiting a lot the outside world? Are they not allowed to? How do you build such an environment where people are not influenced by the internet and by the outside world and are fully immersed in this city environment? And especially when it goes bigger and bigger and the outside world still exists. I want to emphasize on that because I think it's a very important point since uh, back in the days you will see lots of uh, organizations who wanted to create a different world. Communism, before that socialism, they thought about a different world. You have all kinds of communities like kibbutz, uh, technocracy wanted to do something different, metabolism in uh, Japan. Even a bit crazy like this Osho community in fucking US wanted to create a self-sustainable community. It's, what is there, extremely different today. For one, I doubt that you can build a model of a society because it's so complex. But second, what is very different today is that if you want to change the, to create a new environment, you cannot isolate yourself anymore because of the internet. You can't. Most of values comes from, from, from the internet. Your news, your, your entertainment, everything comes, your education comes from the internet. So even if you isolate in a city, you will not get rid of that. So I think that's a big problem. Is this something that TVP is considering even in theory? Yeah, but uh, again, the, what the last idea is is not something that that's uh, that TPP directly. I said this is just one example of how you can do that, and I I would argue that you don't cut people anything. I don't need you to prevent people from going anywhere, uh, because uh, behavioral modification doesn't doesn't uh, require one hundred percent immersion in anything. Okay, you just have to be immersed to some extent in order for it to be effective. So it's like, for example, the fact that you interact on a daily or weekly basis, okay, influences your behavior, okay? You don't have to be, even though that each of you then go back to your world uh, and do, does your everyday life and stuff like that, uh, uh, that affects you to some extent, but it doesn't erase everything else. Uh, uh, so for example, if you go to a supermarket and you're now immersed in, in you know, a trade system where you pay for your groceries, it doesn't erase everything that you learn from trade free. It does affect it to some extent. So the same thing with this kind of kind of uh, uh, way of, of doing it, uh, people can still interact with the outside world, but as assuming that their interaction in this kind of environment is intense enough for long enough duration, that is going to be enough to make to make them to for them to adapt. And what I mean by adapt, well, what you said, what Sasha said about, and, and you also said about. Like what, what? Like how do you design that environment, where uh, or if you if you know the science of behavior, you can design any environment that you that that that's required. Okay. For example, if you want a person to do something, okay. If if I want uh, whatever uh, uh, Cody to to start drinking Coca Cola, okay. Well, I argue I can do that. You know, if I put Cody in a, a very long exposure to a specific environment, you know, I'll be able to do that, okay? So uh, this is a, a wrong use of, of this kind of, uh, you know, science or technology, but uh, sort of you can modify the behavior, any behavior of any person to any behavior if you, you know, apply the, cor the correct methodology. You know, like we can go into that, but that's a few hours of discussion of, you know, how you create 
how there's a stimuli and there's a reinforcer, a positive reinforcer, negative reinforcer, stuff like that. And that's how you encourage sort of uh, a certain type of behavior or you eliminate some type of behavior. Okay. So, uh, I mean, this looks like an immense, immense task to try and provide a both online and offline environment for people to grow out of those ideas. Have you ever looked into uh, similar approaches to get away from the society in small communities? Have you, have you looked into that? Have you looked into such examples? Yeah, yeah. You have, like what you mentioned, kibbutz. Well, I'm, I'm from Israel and I've seen a lot of people that live in kibbutz. They have, uh, you know, they their sort of behavior is different, okay? They have certain culture that do not, like that, that most people in, in Israel do not have. So their behavior were modified to some extent, but A, it wasn't scientifically done, okay? It's not a scientific experiment. It's just people that decide, okay, this is what we're gonna do. This, this is what we do. So these sort of bubbles in the environment that have slightly or to some extent, or maybe more or to a larger extent, modified behavior. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, people can, in, in a bubble sort of, their behavior would modify or can be modified, can change. All what right. Yeah, I, I, I will say that the theory. Yeah. What, 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 yeah. No. In practice, you see, like you see cultures inside cultures, like you see it all the time. So, um, so it's not only only theory, but as I said, like the, the outcome of it, in most cases, is uncontrolled. Okay, it's random. Okay, sort of. Okay, you have, I know, some kibbutz survived, some died, some became very capitalist, some whatever. Uh, but you know, when people are immersed in an environment, well, this is the basis of, of everything that we talk about, you know, how environment affects people. So, you know, uh, yeah. Sorry, you finished? What? Yeah, go ahead. And, um, just with the kibbutz example, I mean, cause you know, you were saying that, you know, some, m some didn't survive or whatever, some morphed. And I feel like I see that happening with this, with any really small community that wants to change the world is you know, because there is this influence, like with kibbutz, you know, people going out into the other, to the real world or whatever, the, the other world and having to, and, and getting jobs and wanting shit and largely influenced by the internet, especially, and other people that I, I feel like it's, it, how can it be a strong enough environment? You know, it's like Tio said, just an immense task to kind of you know, engineer this environment for every single person to make sure they are behaving a particular way and living in this kind of society. Yeah, well, well Jacques talks about it a lot. Uh, like, well, you, you listen to lectures and, and, and stuff that he said, but you know, how you design a building, how you design all of the things in the building so that, you know, uh, people, people would, would behave in a certain way. So assuming that you, you have control over that environment and you can build or design or modify it the way you want, you can create that environment that you, that, that you want. I mean, uh, you, you can build, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. You can build buildings, you know, and you can give people access to food and other things they need. And I can see that as being, you know, much more positive environment. But yeah, you, can you convince most people to stop using Instagram? you know or facebook or maybe you know, i don't use instagram or facebook i was exposed world. yeah yeah go ahead yeah, go i no, was I'm exposed. just saying like enough enough people sorry enough people to have an impact on the actual global society to be able to have yeah. you know so much influence that you can eventually you know change the the, the actual bigger the entire world civilization i mean that's a much bigger, you know. Yeah. <laughs> go, yeah. Go ahead, Ludos. No, I just, I'm sort of, I'm not sure if I'm missing something, but a lot of the conversations are sort of reinforcer this and negative, positive, the other. I'm just curious, why not just take what already works? I mean, advertising isn't a trillion dollar, whatever industry for nothing. It, You know what I mean? It, it has its effects and it, Clause yourself into uh, whatever service. I mean, talk about Instagram, good example. But then also the the other example. I mean, somebody else in uh, 
other chat asked about general semantics. Has anybody read about general semantics? And it's a great question because then you're able to essentially join different techniques. So using advertising to essentially dissociate uh, identification between word and a thing. So then you start to quite literally indoctrinate people that the map is not the territory. You, you are not lazy. That doesn't exist anywhere in your brain or in your biochemical makeup of your chassis. It's just a thing that somebody says when X, you know, et cetera, thoughts occur. But so already the tools for shaping human behavior do exist. They're disparate, I'll give you that, but they absolutely do function. You know what I mean? All it takes is just to look at insane shift of Eddie Bernays being able to literally say, hey, you women, yeah, I know you feel powerless. Take this fucking death stick between your lips and now you have control and power. I mean, that's fucking insane. But he was successful. And, and this is just for some sort of stick. I mean, when, you know, connecting all these several concepts, like, for instance, first of all, are your needs cared for? Are your needs met? As a citizen in this particular experimental environment, let's say the answer is yes. Well, then you move into a very different kind of set of problems. They're certainly not going to be that, oh, fuck, I'm parsed and I have lead in my water. You know what I mean? They're going to be different things. Like maybe, sure, let's say it's very valid to say Instagram addiction or games or whatever. Oh, fuck, I need my fix. But then... I mean, how long does it really take before you look at all these other things? Like basically, like when you keep seeing people who are distracted and easily distracted, reality really doesn't take that long to kick in. Like, oh, what about the ocean? Do you even know how to swim? Oh, yes, no, I don't know, I'm scared, whatever. You know, here's a support network to do X, Y, Z activities that previously maybe just didn't have appeal because Look at the 4K double screen, wide screen. Look at the resolutions, VR shit. Have you ever jumped off the building? No, uh, you know, all that. So I'm just saying, connecting what already seems to work, indoctrination in whatever format, you know what I mean? I'm just not afraid of language like that. Propaganda is just basically using repetitive messages for a particular purpose. If you're able to indoctrinate people to say nationalism in my country, I mean, how difficult really technically would it be to have select few people who would agree with the central premise that that's why I'm going into this environment. This is the at least assumed purpose. D does any of that make sense? Uh, I would say that uh, to me, it's all, always boils down to what do you want to do? What do you want to do? All of these strategies, what's your, honestly, what do you just want to provide? Food for people, water to care about people, to make a safer environment and so forth. What do you want? And, and in my mind, uh, what do we want is to fix a problem. That's what dri drives me, fix a problem. Like most things in this world are based upon that. Why do we have airplanes now? Because we have, we have to solve a problem, like moving James to like Karen and like they have to like go travel, you know? Uh, and same here, like what do you want? So I want to ask Alex, what does DVP want really? Because it's it seems to want many, many, many things, but why do you what do you want why do you think it's such the wrong thing is this society what you want to do something there why well <clears throat> yeah i think we, we share a lot of uh, a lot of those values if i may uh briefly to, to, to what Ludo said uh well advertising industry uses behavioral science so we're talking about the same thing on the underlying level okay the main difference is whether it's uh you know mindfully the behavior is being modified, so people come in and they understand that the behavior would change, or it's you know subliminal and you don't tell the people and stuff like that, which is what the, ad the industry do is doing. Uh, so you might not you might not need to go that way where you have to hide what you're doing and stuff like that. And regarding what uh, what what Tia uh, said, well, I think we can we, we can agree easily that we want a future society and both what Trump talks about and what TVP talks about, Izzy and talks about where we don't have coercion, we don't have violence, we don't have wars, we don't have deprivation, you know, poverty. Okay, well, people can, can live peacefully together and stuff like that. So, you know, this is where we want to, to this one to where we want to go, right? Mm -hmm. What creates those? Uh, what do you mean what creates those? What creates hunger and poverty? It can be many different things. Like, do you want to show? Like, you're. I know you're looking for, you know, for a single reason. 
Uh, but... I'm, looking, I'm looking for answers. You know, I'm looking what creates what creates what, what let's create one single thing: hunger. You know, why are people dying of hunger? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they don't have access to food. Why didn't we have access to food? Again, for me, like we, I can start uh, explaining why, but I'm not sure you're looking for the answer that I'm going to provide. No, no, I'm not looking for anything. I, I'm curious, like why? Why are people? There are some people in Africa or whatever, and they're like starving. Why will throw away tons of foods? Why? Why can't they have access to that food? Do you, do you well, uh, the, the the real answer is it in some cases A, in some cases B, in some cases C. So A can be. Okay, there's not enough food produced in that area, and there's no one that's going to transfer food into their area. B can be there is food, they don't have access to it because someone prevents them, okay, or don't, don't physically are not able to access that food. Okay, C, uh, they can access the food theoretically if they trade it for something. Okay, so the, like the, I, 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 I'm careful, I don't want to provide, I just say, you know, the, you say, what is the reason? Uh, the problem with that is that assumes there's one reason. Okay, the word V assumes that there's one but uh you know the answer doesn't have to be as simple you know it can okay. be more complex the real answer is this place called Svalbard is is very uh, remote like nothing is pro produced there basically it's an island in the north of the, the planet of the earth and you don't even need a, need a visa there you can live there somehow those people don't starve the reason that they, somehow those people don't starve is because they can trade something away to give that food to them it's not a problem of distance. It's not a problem of it's it's fucking cold there. It's cold as fuck. There are polar bears. You need a gun to go out. Okay. The reason that they don't go to Africa to give people to those people to, to the other to this hunger hunger hungry people is the, is because those people have no value in this society. They cannot give anything. I think that's the main reason they don't. They cannot give anything back if they were were a market there. Oh, they will go there quickly, very very quickly. All of these companies will go there and sell that food. So in, in my mind, uh, if those people could trade something for that food in one way or another, they will be clients in this world. And clients in this world are not left to die because of hunger because someone could provide that food for them. Uh, it, it's enough food. We agree with that. It's enough food in this world. It's a problem of access. I would say it's kind of bizarre to say it's a problem of access when you can transport shit everywhere. Like most shit comes from China. It comes from the north of the US and the south and everywhere. It's not a problem of access for fuck's sakes. Africa is not a like a really bad territory to go in and deliver stuff. There are places in Africa where they have abundant stuff. The neighbors have very few of those abundant stuff. So to me, I would say that hunger is created because we have so much food and those people who cannot be part of the system cannot get access to that food because they cannot trade anything in return for that. That's my explanation. To me, I think it's simplistic, but I, that's what I'm arguing for. Mm -hmm. you know um, yeah but yeah. I, I, you know <laughs> like you can explain it that way but you know uh uh the fact that there is one reason doesn't mean that that's the only reason okay so that's sort of you know uh the problem with reasoning okay uh, i can provide more explanation why it it's, it's a complex problem that is caused by multiple factors okay and uh it is not defined because are we talking about that hungry person in Somalia? Are we talking about that hungry person uh, on the street in New York? Are we so, you know. Uh, What's the I, difference? Uh, well, the, the difference is that they might be in different situations. Okay, maybe there's some person in jail in uh, 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 in the Congo, and the, he's dying from food because he's locked behind behind bars, okay, no one's giving you food. So he has not access. Even if he has all the money in the world, he won't be able to do anything with it because in the prison, he cannot communicate with anyone. He's in solitary or confinement, whatever. So, you know, so I can give you, for every example, I can give you some extreme example, you know, for, for something else. Uh, but, but these examples don't serve well because these are ex we don't talk about this kind of people. Yes, the world is not perfect. I'm talking about the nine million people who die every year of starvation that mm -hmm. they're in a very poor situation. They're not people in prison in this this specific example in the solitary confinement in Congo, you know. And I'm sure if you give money to this guy as much as he wants, he will bribe people and he'll bribe his way out. I can give you many examples of those fucking things, you know. <laughs> it's not a problem. But I'm talking about real examples of those dying people. In Africa, but you said something about those people in New York, let's say homeless people who were very poor, who don't have anything to eat. That's the same reason they don't have anything to eat. If they could 
give something away and get that food. Like supermarkets are full of food. No one refuses them if they go there and pay some 20 bucks for, for a meal or for something. No one. But probably they start because they don't have those money. Why don't they have their money? Because they have very little value, if no, in the society. If they had some value, could trade their work skills or something, they will make some money and then they will get that food. But I don't want to get lost in these specific examples. My, my question, why I ask you, like, what creates those problems is because Jack too, you know, the Venus Project, he talked a lot about why these problems are actually a result of this monetary system, of this, this perverse profit-based system that pushes people to do all kinds of perverse things. Yes, that's not the entirety of the, the problems that we have in the world. Cancer may not be, well, indir indirectly might be, you know, because it's not investment and so forth. But most problems, what problems, I asked you this on, on a comment, but you never reply. What problems in this world are not a, result, a direct result of trade or trade-based system or highly influenced by this trade-based system? Do you know any examples? Yeah, I intentionally didn't, res didn't respond there because it opens up a Pandora box of a few hours of discussion. Mm -hmm. So that format of the chat is, is, is not very, very good, at least for me, like I, uh, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't work well for, for my device. So anyhow, so, uh, so I think this requires a, a, whole, a whole discussion about it. But yeah, there, there's a myriad of examples. So for example, you have uh, like cultures where you have sort of the, the, the father of the family has ownership of the kids and of the wife, okay? Uh, for, and like, you can maybe explain how somehow it relates to trade, you know? But I, I don't see that, 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 that ultimate 100% uh, you know, connection. So, you know, you have Is this a big example? What? Like, is this a very specific example? Is something that happens for with lots of people in like whatever parts of the world? What are you referring yeah, exactly it, to? What? For example, in the, in the Muslim world, okay, or mm -hmm. even some Arab countries which are, aren't, aren't Muslim uh, and, and other countries which are non-Arab non, non and non-Muslim. Yeah, but in that world, there are a lot of instances where, uh, you know, a woman is sort of doesn't have any control over or almost any control over her life uh, because this is what culturally accepted. Okay, like if you if you leave the family, you're going to be killed or whatever. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't see the trade, uh, you know, in that thing. At least not in the classical definition of trade. If you really really extend it, maybe you can somehow touch that. But you know, these kind of things are um, you know uh, they are cultural and are behavioral and stem from from places where people uh, need power because if they don't have power they will likely to whatever, not survive in the society or whatever. And they uh, gain this power by, or it can be the family cell or it can be slavery, okay? For example, I can build uh, like a trade-free area here, but I would enslave people in some other area just to support <laughs> this area. So, you know, I can do stuff like that, theoretically, you know. Um, yeah, okay, so. if, if I can comment on that, like th this example, first of all, that's what we say, like most problems, uh, I argue, are created because of trade, not all problems. I was very specific of that. You cannot say all problems. Sure, maybe the example that you give is not, has nothing to do with trade, though maybe if we unwrap and, and unpeel this kind of uh, situation like we could do with an onion, we'd make cry toward the end because probably it it goes back to the same problems of people not having access to education, maybe not having access to resources. It doesn't matter. Let's suppose that that's a, that's a problem uh, that not influenced by trade. Yes, there will be such things, but is that like as huge of a problem as uh, so many pe most people being enslaved on this planet and the pollution and the climate change? This is one of the examples that let's say it doesn't fit in that model, but we cannot aim for uh, p p solving all of the world's problems you know so i don't think this example is as relevant i will say for for my point here my point is that the source of most problems and i would say climate change i would say hunger in the world i would say pollution i would say waste of resources i would say poor education i would say stress you know i would say separation of of people in all kinds of tribes and groups i would say collection of data and advertisement all kinds of social credits even that is in a way of forced trade people are like if you want to live you know, on this on this planet, or in China, you have to respect our laws. Laws. If you don't respect our laws, you are put in prison. Your liberty is taken away from you. You know. So even that, I would call it as a forced trade. You have no other choice. But if you trade away your fr fr privacy and your freedom and say, "I'll respect that," 
I'll walk nicely, clothes on, you know, saying, yes, China is great. I can do it. So without all that being said, I agree with you. There will be some examples that don't fit into this trade triggers, these problems, but they are either not as significant or maybe if you unpeel them, you may find that they are connected in one way or another with- I, do, I think they the are connected because ideologies are put in place <laughs> to preserve the trade-based system. Ah, yeah. So like the fact that some cultures believe that women are property relates back to the ideologies that were put in place to serve to serve that system. Or like if you have a group of people that are enslaved to make a, a trade fee island, I don't know what you're, um, you know, you have to instill those ideologies into those people to allow other people to be enslaved, you know? So it, it does relate back. And if you look like, say, Iran, uh, Iran is in a, in a dispute of resources and power and so forth with all kinds of other tribes. Of course, they will want to reinforce their own values, their, the Muslim values, to, to keep a hold on their statuses in a way in this game of moving shit from one place to another and holding power. So in a way, yeah, the promotion of these values could be also, if I'm peeled, related to this trade-based system that we live under. And before Alex may reply, I wanted to, to, to mention that you say this example of you make you can create a trade free thing here, but on the backs of maybe slaves or, or your coerced people. If you can give me some examples, because I can give you many examples of trade free goods and services that are anything but the opposite. So the theory here is fine, but theory has its limitations, of course. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so so there were a few few things that that, that were were uh, raised here. Uh, <clears throat> Well, uh, oh, where should I start? <laughs> uh, yeah, so obviously, like anything you you can find, like when you have a a a, a complex uh, a complex system, okay, so you can find a link between anything to any anything, okay. So obviously, you can find how that kind of behavior relates to trade, okay. But you can also find how this relates to other other things, okay um yeah, like power or whatever or control over people okay so um so the fact that that you can connect to something doesn't mean that it's exclusive it doesn't mean that it's negligible the trade i i do agree that trade has a very 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 central uh you know have has very central influence on how our society is built today i'm just uh uh, uh considering or suggesting that uh, even if you eliminate all trade, for example, let's take a closed environment and eliminate all trade there, okay, are we sure that in that environment, you know, negative behavior wouldn't stay or wouldn't develop, okay? I, I, I argue that I don't see any theoretical basis for that uh, other than, you know, arguing uh, since we, we don't have example for that, then it probably won't happen, which is not scientific argument, you know? Well, but we have examples for that. Uh, yeah. We have examples, take uh, as an ecosystem, you can take YouTube and you can take archive.org. You know, there are two organizations that offer video streaming, for example, and mm -hmm. you may consider it's not that important, but it's millions of people, billions use them, mm -hmm. get their education from there and communicate and so forth. If you analyze the two, you will realize a lot more charlatan behaviors from YouTube and whatever revolves around it, from YouTube itself, for, from the people who post shit there, because they post there, all kinds of clickbait just for people to watch that. From YouTube, limiting people, putting ads, having lying to the, the, the governments that they don't collect data while they collect and so forth. You'll find a cluster of bad behaviors around YouTube. If you take that as an example that is non-for-profit, they don't want anything from you. They just let you upload videos there. You'll see much better behaviors. It's not paradise, but it's a much better behavior. You'll see more honest uh, reactions from them, more, uh, more honest platform. You don't see ads, don't see data tracking, don't see limitations. You can upload as much as you want there. You see better behaviors from people who upload there. Schools use that, it's, it's a lot, use that for education, use a lot for co free content creators and so forth. So that's just one example. I give multiple examples in the book. You can take NASA versus SpaceX. You can take open source versus proprietary software. You can take any company versus a non-profit alternative and you will find that. And I think that's an evidence. Why would you not consider that as an evidence, for example? Yeah, I consider it as an evidence for 
uh, remo for removal of trade in many instances would produce a, a society closer to what we want. Okay, but this is not an example or proof of removing trade would eliminate all bad behavior or behavior that we don't want to see in the environment. <laughs> okay, so it's you know it's 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 an example. What the example you gave aligns totally with what I say. I think trade has very very substantial and central component in in, in everything. Okay. Uh, but it doesn't contradict what I say that there are other factors as well. So if you have multiple factors and you remove one of them, in most cases, you would get closer to your goal. Okay. But that doesn't mean you reach your goal yet. You might need to remove additional things. And these things might be, you know, culture, culturally ingrained things that maybe somehow develop because of trade, but they are now here and they would, they can perpetuate without trade for decades and decades and decades. Okay. Like this. <laughs> Behavior in a, in a, in a, in a family, okay? Maybe it's somewhat originated due to trade, but it's here now. So even if you put these people and remove trade, they might perpetuate this behavior for many, 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 many years. If you don't provide additional solutions, you know, uh, like like uh, like behavior modification, uh, like uh, education, uh, you know, like abundance, maybe in some things and stuff like that. So that's, that's, all, saying. That, that's kind of all a part of the package that we're talking about, though, because people should have access to trade free education. They should have access to trade free goods and services. So if those families had access to relevant education and to what they need in life and, and the things that they want, then then those women probably wouldn't be, you know, subject. They wouldn't be owned by these men They, mm -hmm. you know, the if they're brought up in an environment where they're, you know, exposed to a relevant education and they have what they need. So because yeah. we argue that relevant education will come when you take away this profit motive, this like if you want to just make education because you want to sell data or collect data, then you won't provide better education. But if you remove that incentive, then the educational content will be more relevant. But I want to mention this thing. Let's not brush aside uh, this trade as being just one of the triggers of problems. What we do in everyday life, where the hour when we wake up, how we build buildings, where we build buildings, what food we eat, what food we create, scientific research, what scientific research is done or not. Our entire lives revolve around us trading shit. Like wars could be many of them related to that. It's not just a single, uh, uh, like, a, like, a, like a side thing, you know, is the trigger of our, pretty much all of our lives. You know, why do you think most people in this world work, wake up at 6 a.m.? Why do you think they put their kids into kindergarten or school? Because they have to put them somewhere that they cannot leave them with anyone. Why do you think school don't care as much about education? Because like we explained, teachers care about their payments. So I, if I unpeel this, this society, I see very little uh, evidence that, I see very little problems that are not triggered by trade. And you are right, there are some problems, but I see very little of those. And I say, we should not ignore those, but my focus is on this because it's such a big one that I think is is worth it to focus on. You know, that's my my stance. Yeah, I think we, we in general we agree. I, I I don't think you should modify the way I should change what you're doing because your focus in trade is great. Okay, and I, I personally would also support additional projects, maybe like TVP, that focus on additional things. Okay, and the combination of these. I think can produce an environment or, or a society that is what we're looking for. Okay. Yeah, sure. I, I understand I that. I and I it's hope, practical yeah. for any person or any organization to focus on everything. Okay. Because then you focus on nothing. And, mm -hmm. uh, and we need sort of, you know, it, it's like when you're, uh, if you want you know, open source solutions, there's, you don't go to Microsoft and they would mm -hmm. give all the open source solutions. Now you have multiple people that, that developed, that they, they focus their time and attention and, and resource and everything on this one thing. And this one thing works really great. But if you come to them uh, for something else, they wouldn't have any solution for you. Okay, they said, no, we focus on this and we did this really great thing. We cannot help you with that other thing that we have no clue of. So I think that's impractical for just one organization to do everything, at least not with the current means, theories, whatever. I don't see it happening anytime soon. So I think that only maybe when we reach that society that acts as a system, you might you know, go to the society as an individual and say, hey, I need a cure for this disease. 
and this society would produce it, but this is so distant in the future, and maybe it would go that way. Maybe no, maybe it would still say, you know, in chunks of, you know, different cultures, different whatever, different. But I think in, in current, our current society, it's impractical for one organization to provide all solutions for everything and focus on, on many, many different things instead of, you know, a defined set of things. That's why I think Trump should do what, what he does and then TVP should do what Dali does. And that's why I talked about collaboration, but this is, you know, maybe it's a different uh, discussion that we can touch on, on, uh, on later. But I think every, each of these organizations should and must exist in order for us to get somewhere in this world. Okay, no, I, I, I get that. And I would say that as long as we know what we also fight against, we will be able to develop similar paths towards similar solutions. And that was the, yeah, we made a huge stop here, but we will end this in a few minutes. Uh, yeah, what I changed in my mind since with the documentary is this thing about like, I, I think if we focus on trade as the main trigger of mo multiple problems, you can come up with better and more realistic solutions rather than trying to change the world in this way that TVP wants. And if they actually, and I said that a couple of times, they should keep on doing that. I mean, uh, because, okay, if you do it differently and if you do it uh, in a, yeah, this way of like try to build something or try to have this encompassing vision and why not such organizations should exist, you know? So let, let that be as, as it is, but my focus shifted towards this, you know, and uh, yeah, I'll make Trump to documentary all about the, the, this, this ideas. And I will explain in the past how people try to change the world, maybe what failed, what didn't, what is our approach. But I think it's it's enough for, for today to discuss about the, the three sort of basic elements of work. We discussed many, many times, maybe we'll discuss more in the future. But uh, that was the, the, the big, big idea here because I relied a lot on the resource based economy as a solution, alternative solution. And I don't think it's it's a wrong, I will not delete that part or whatever. I think it's a lot to learn from there. It's a lot of interesting ideas. This sh focus sh shifted. So if you want to learn about Rome, I will recommend the original most problems book or the money game game book. And the rest of the parts of the, the documentary are more about trying to instill something in people. Like I like this dilemma of like why people don't change is this theory that is uh, like you have like uh, like people who get used to something is very difficult for them to change their behavior and uh, yeah, i made two more parts just uh, i have nothing against those parts i think they are interesting parts mm -hmm. you know it's just more motivational and stuff like that you know and that's the entire like big huge hour huge 14 hour uh, trump documentary and that was like that's a like, four hour trump cast is the longest that we had and cody almost fell asleep i almost died we have to wake him I almost up almost died <laughs> Woo, we are hungry one. we are <laughs> Yeah, we we want maybe let's just I will go through the news like in two minutes with in all of the news, Lightning. just like take them off bam, 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 of bam, bam, my bam. list. Got it. <laughs> all right. Switching um, to news then. Yeah, yeah, just quickly, quickly. Okay. I want uh, to point out some news here. Are you just gonna... This is from Trump Created News. I just like with the police departments, deadly yeah. histories parked in Amazon. It's a news about how you know, today people have this uh, smart, uh, how you call those? Like you look through the door, how you call those? The I ring doorbell. Or ring doorbell oh, or something. Well. <laughs> yeah, you have cameras, you know, not like in the old days, you look with your motherfucking eye, you know, you just, you have a camera, right? Yeah, it's a people. Pe people? The people. The people. You peep through. Not a people. Oh, peep through. People. 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 <laughs> <Come on. laughs> and now they are they are they are cool you know so they're most of them are owned by amazon to the ring company and this company of course collects data and so forth but it allows police to also access the cameras if they want to so they can look through your door to see maybe not inside but outside to investigate shit but it's a scary thing that if they have access to this you'll see more and more of such uh, yeah because amazon is a company they care about making profits so they want to be okay with the law and stuff like that. But it's a reminder of how smart new things are actually intrusive new things, you know. We have another news about this remdesivir. It's a drug that the uh, US was thinking, oh my God, it's such a good drug to fight coronavirus. And they said, why not buy the entire fucking supply of remdesivir from the world? Because they are really nice folks, you know, everybody loves America now. Um, and they, but then they realized that well, it's not that effective anyway. So whatever, you know, they spent Oops. some money, but 
probably was kind of a bit of a scam because mm-hmm. companies wanted to, yeah, US, buy it. Yes, it, cure, it cures everything. Oh, yeah. Malaria, cancer, COVID, you know. Now, now we can Easy. market it and sell it to the entire world. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. US, yeah, yeah. Turn yeah. around. They are good at that. <laughs> Put uh, and because. And just a few more because of this COVID and so forth, people stay at home. And um, how do you deal with uh, medical problems? So, telemedicine, be- they force telemedicine into existence. For fuck's sake, couldn't you do it before? So now people can stay at home and talk to their doctor. And that's how it should be, you know. So, do you consult more people faster and, and so forth? So, it's good to see that there is forced to do something about that. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> Don't believe. Um, yeah. Don't believe proven liars. The absolute minimum standard of rodents and merger <laughs> scrutiny. Yeah, this is like another brief example of like Microsoft, no, uh, Facebook, uh, Google, and Amazon. How they say we won't do this, but they do exactly that. So one example is uh, Amazon said because it's such a big store and everybody sells there, they said, oh, we we won't like collect data to create competitive products. Bullshit. So this is what they do. If they see algorithm, the algorithm sees that people are interested interested in very fancy dildos, like very uh, not that expensive and very colorful. Uh, Amazon says we create a dildo that is like five dollars uh, less of that price, cheaper, and we promote it on our website. So now everybody buys dildos from Amazon, so they get fucked in the ass by the Amazon. That's the moral of the story, you know, because they put them at a cheaper price. Motherfuckers, you know, <laughs> that's what they do. <laughs> Sorry for those who love dildos, I have nothing against those. You know. <laughs> and how we go from how we go from dildos from from dildos to mole, mole rats? Naked mole ask, rats. Just... Naked mole rats. I mean, <laughs> naked <laughs> mole rats. <laughs> <laughs> it's just this story about how, um, and you can find all of these links in the show notes, in the description, whatever. Uh, naked mole rats are resistant to to cancer. And they thought that it's something with their cells, but now they realize it's probably something around the cells in that environment. So we have to all become mole rats if we want to get rid of cancer. That's the moral of the story. Excellent. I can do that. <sighs> okay, two yeah. more, something. Two more. Pirate streaming site? <laughs> yeah. Uses the Associated yeah, Press for promo campaign. Isn't it funny? Is that the Associated Press is this non-for-profit organization, and then uh, pirating website? They accept paid. Uh, there's another example of how trade fucks things up, because they accept paid uh, articles. So if you pay them, they put your article. They don't even look at you. Mm. Publish it in the Associated Press. People with torrent websites, these illegal websites, realize that, and now they pay Associated Press to put articles about themselves. Because Google removes them from search engines. So they said, oh no, but now we put an article on Associated Press. And when people search for like torrents.eu or whatever, they come across this article and then you still have traffic. So just like you pay them, even if they are a non for profit, as long as they accept this fucking trade, it's like, oh, we need money for articles. They don't care about articles anymore, you know. And, and they are very well known as good journalism, whatever, but they fuck things up, they fuck things up. Oopsies. Uh, LibTorrent adds web torrent support, expanding the reach of browser torrenting. Oh yeah. You're happy about that, Cody? I will take that. Except I still it's QB torrent, man. You can't beat that fucking search, brother. <laughs> yeah, well, whatever. It's about uh, like sharing uh, videos online, and now it's it's easier to share that in a decentralized way. So hooray for that. Good job, and that's Yay. great. And I think that's all it is. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's all it is. That's all it is. That's all it is. All right. right. No, killing it. It's killed. killed That's it, man. We are hungry. We we are tired. We are. (laughs) Let's just take a break, my friend. Let's take a break. Thank you, Alex, for participating and for your input. And uh, we may do another Trumpcast with Alex, specifically with Alex talking about collaboration between these organizations and why we cannot collaborate or why we can. We'll see. We'll see. You know, no spoilers. No spoilers. Okay. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, yeah. Good day. All good day, right, man. my friends. Let's just go into paradise oh, now. Uh, paradise. Cody? Yes. Uh, take it Burn it, Cody. Setting it on fire. <laughs> I'm, yeah. al- I'm already here in paradise. <laughs> <laughs>